In the history of digital role-playing games, there are titles that stand as towering classics, unforgettable, irreplaceable examples of some of the best of that era's design. Baldur's Gate 2, The Witcher 3, Skyrim. And then there's the other role-playing games, the ones that were just as hard to make, but slipped farther and farther away from our collective memory as time goes on. Neverwinter Nights was an incredibly bold, industry-changing title when it was released. It was the first game where Bioware, as a company, shifted away from storytelling as a primary design value and looked towards what it was mechanically that these digital worlds could accomplish, with an eye towards multiplayer engagement particularly. It was one of the very first games to release extensive DLC with their years-long premium module strategy, pumping out expansion after expansion between two and four years after the base game came out. Neverwinter Nights was a turning point for the whole role-playing subgenre. It was a weather vane for things to come, and a nostalgic anchor for game design techniques from long ago. It even spawned an Obsidian-led sequel. Neverwinter Nights and, and its expansions, premium modules, community modules, sequel, and the expansions for that sequel represent a mammoth amount of creativity and development effort. And, yet, they rarely pop up on anyone's top ten lists. They're not forgotten, not exactly, but they were niche products even at the time. Metacritic shows the final expansion for Neverwinter Nights 2 with just shy of a dozen official reviews internationally. I didn't even know that the expansion existed before I read about it being bundled into the GOG edition of the game. When you go to top 50 RPG list, you'll see some of the Neverwinter Nights titles, maybe another few if you dial it out to a top 100 list, but what list is appropriate for the premium modules? How do you rank something like Wyvern Crown of Cormyr? It's got the most intense jousting ever seen in a Dungeons & Dragons adventure. God damn do you joust, but these games are old, awkward, and very wildly in quality and length. Their games stuck in between one era and another, a strange compromise between the story-first isometric era that Obsidian and Paradox have come back around to in recent years, and the increasingly mechanically-oriented, multiplayer-minded Bioware that's about to release Anthem here in 2018. The last thing like the Neverwinter Nights games was Bioware's Dragon Age Origins, which was, in many ways, a direct descendant of what Bioware did here with their Forgotten Realms titles. But Dragon Age is a classic. Neverwinter Nights 2 is not. Baldur's Gate is a classic. Neverwinter Nights 1 is not. How come? Playing and talking about a classic is always comfortable ground. There's already a whole trail network of thought and critique, of assumptions and understandings, and plain old memes about the game already available. Neverwinter Nights, though, feels different. For some of these premium modules, I could only find a single professional review contemporary with their release. They seem to be completely absent from the broader conversation about RPGs in any meaningful way at all. And yet, each of these games has this gleaming core of creative ambition, smaller and smaller studios and development teams finding themselves with a shot at an officially licensed D&D product. Every last team, no matter how small, took the weight of that creative responsibility seriously. To talk about the RPGs we all know are classic, it's exciting to be part of the conversation, to engage with an obviously meaningful landmark work. This video, though, we're going to do something different. With Neverwinter Nights, you're not at the front of the library with the staff recommended table and the new releases. This video, we're going back into the stacks, where the shelves grow taller and the light turns flickering dim under an old fluorescent bulb. Take a volume down, though, blow off the dust, and the adventure begins again, unaware of the passage of time. Neverwinter Nights 1 is a platform for storytelling more than it's a story itself. Its self-conception was never solely rooted in a single adventure, like the isometrics with their hand-drawn backgrounds. From the beginning, the idea was to give the player the ability to create and participate in D&D adventures as both player and dungeon master, to create a digital environment for interpersonal multiplayer role-playing. In 2002, they were doing this. It's a hugely forward-thinking design, and a bold one for completely re-examining the assumptions of the Bioware RPG up to this point, namely that story and character are the bedrock of a computer D&D experience. In the world of exquisitely detailed 2D backgrounds, it usually had to be. Story gives direction, and a density of storytelling lets you use one single hub map for a huge variety of quests and content. Neverwinter Nights would be different because its 3D engine allowed it to be different. It's worth noting how willingly and starkly different a game this is than any that Bioware had made before this point. Neverwinter Nights is, at its heart, a tool set. The campaign Bioware made for it is one of the most truly boring, half-assed ones they've ever done. Mass Effect Andromeda, for all of its failings, is a much deeper and better presented script than this. Neverwinter Nights 1 is the single most mediocre story in Bioware's catalog, but by the time you're done with it, you're left with two important pieces of knowledge. One, you know how a campaign is structured. 
how the maps are bound together in a module, how quest triggers work, and what the general limitations of the Aurora engine are. You learn all this because these usually hidden processes are completely transparent in Neverwinter Nights. The environments are angular and bare. It's a game of hallways and doors. All the ways things hinge together, all the thresholds you cross to trigger conversations or traps, all of them are plain against the largely undecorated background. Conversation is even relegated to a small corner of the screen, where once the words were given a whole half of the visual field, now they're simply another menu mode alongside your inventory and character sheet. Dialogue is a feature of 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons, but it's not the primary one. Quests, as a result, are primarily transactional. It's not who you know, it's what node you trigger that counts. Good dialogue in Neverwinter Nights is a problem that gets solved in a few different ways as we move deeper into the content, but in starting to talk about the first game, the foundation of a half decade's worth of storytelling, and more, the most striking and important element of the base experience is this naked mechanical formatting. Neverwinter Nights never really even wanted to hide the rules of the game from the player. The implementation of the tabletop rule set and the world building tools available to player and dungeon master alike in this digital environment was the game. It was an attempt to be newly faithful to the Source tabletop game by translating it differently than before, more mechanically, more structurally, than any 2D isometric, including Icewind Dale, had done or broadly been able to do. So when you're finished with the main campaign, its construction is no mystery. You see how the trick was done, every nut, every bolt, every weld. And then the second piece of important knowledge trickles down, the muted, gnawing sense that there's got to be a way to do this better. Isn't that the job of a template? To provide definition without personality? To encourage those using the template to fill all the details in with their own creative priorities? The main campaign of the original game is, in every way that counts, default Bioware. Three-act structure? Check. Ancient creator races coming back to destroy the newer civilizations? check -a Before Knights of the Old Republic, before Mass Effect, before Dragon Age, this played with the exact same general setup. Companions with slowly revealed backstories? Check! All the features of what we think of when we think Bioware, all their signature little flourishes, find them right here, but presented in the most straightforward, lackluster, agonizingly stretched out way possible. Truly, if Neverwinter Nights had been even slightly memorable in the details of its storytelling, people would have thrown up their hands and said, you've done this before, when it comes to something like Mass Effect. But the difference is that the later game hits all the storytelling beats this one missed, with an energy and a visual bombast far beyond anything Neverwinter Nights initially offered. Mass Effect is a classic. Neverwinter Nights is not. Who could forget the Reapers? But even among people who have beaten Neverwinter Nights, a lot of the ones I've talked to kind of forgot about the whole long, convoluted plot about how lizard people from thousands of years ago had enslaved the Sword Coast and conspire from the shadows to do so again. To be fair, the campaign takes nearly 80 hours, and the lizards don't take a huge amount of that time, but they have, in terms of importance, similar weight in the script as the Reapers do. The scale and length of Neverwinter Nights' main campaign foils any momentum that these revelations might have built up. Each act takes 20 hours or more, and are proportioned about as evenly as the user interface. A little bit of dialogue, a lot of inventory management, and a lot of fiddling with spellbooks and abilities. The first act takes place in the city of Neverwinter, hunting magical creatures across four districts, each with their own theme. They can be tackled in any order. The second act has you looking for clues as to a mysterious cult's whereabouts. It's the longest of the acts, and also has four major components which can be done in freeform order. This act takes place ac across wide-ranging wilderness and small rural se settlements. Classic adventuring stuff. The third act does the same, but with higher stakes for higher levels. It ends with dragons. But it's only here at the margins of the third act where they start going ham on the ancient reptilian conspiracy. It's easy to remember the format, the openness, the sense of adventure. It's equally easy, easy to forget when the game comes to you at the last minute to say, Also, dude, the lizard people are real and they secretly want to rule the world. Because Neverwinter Nights was designed with multiplayer in mind, the party dynamics of the single player experience are agonizingly bad. There are companions available for any kind of character class in the game, whatever you like, but only one of them at a time. Dungeons & Dragons, as a whole, is oriented around the party. The more players, the better balance, the more options you'll have to navigate a dungeon. And most of your time in the main campaign is all about the dungeons. The majority of items in the game are randomly generated from loot tables, just like, as the core rules say you're supposed to do. This often means that the majority of items are worthless garbage. 
it's hellacious to try to save money. You'll still be picking up less than a dozen gold pieces at a time at level 15. The exceptions to this are random loot for large chests, which are, with just a tiny fraction of exceptions, trapped and locked. Fucking all of them. And so are most dungeons in general, with traps that often instantly kill your character, causing a penalty in experience points and gold. What you really need is a rogue. You can play one yourself and choose freely from the other companions, or you can choose literally any other class for yourself and find yourself completely at the mercy of locks and traps that you clumsily trip over, one entanglement spell blending into another fireball trap, blending into the umpteenth instant kill negative energy trap. Listen when I tell you, this campaign is just insufferable without a dedicated rogue. Luckily, they have one. Just one. Good old Tommy Undergallows. I have played this game three times, twice when I was younger and once for this video. I have never used a companion besides Tommy, because I almost never want to play as a thief myself. Tommy has repeating dialogue for most activities. Across 80 hours of play ago, I think I've heard each of his repeating lines somewhere between 1 and 20 billion times, and I still barely know anything about him as a character. Unlike modern Bioware games, or earlier Bioware games for that matter, the dialogue triggers for Tommy are based on your character leveling up before hitting certain triggers. Playing unevenly or forgetting about Tommy's quest for a level can easily result in missed triggers and missed quests. I tried hard to get Tommy's dialogue to trigger this time around, and it still only very sporadically did. But what I did get was as generic base template as the rest of it. I'm a halfling thief, I am, I am, is his whole shtick. It doesn't get nuanced, it doesn't get better. He just tells you more stock standard stories of chaotic neutral adventure. The other characters, from what dialogue I saw, are similarly familiar combinations of race, class, and alignment. They're instantly recognizable as D&D archetypes, and instantly forgettable as such, too. They're the characters you see on the cover and in the illustrations of the player's handbook, useful cliches to springboard off of when designing your own material. Familiar, but anonymous. Mechanically, Tommy is indispensable. I hate adventuring without him because he spots the traps and unlocks the chests. I hate adventuring with him because he's annoying as hell and he never shuts up. A classic adventuring relationship. To be sure, especially with the halfling thief being the annoying one. But consider, each trap, each individual chest, has a countdown timer, a long one, and a line of acknowledgement dialogue. If you open 50 chests, you wait maybe two and a half minutes total, and you hear, Oi, consider it done! 50 times, and then maybe another two and a half minutes of nose-picking timer bars and 50 line readings on top of that to disarm the traps. It's just awful. It's time-consuming and repetitive in the worst way, and because the loot is randomly generated, the likelihood it'll be worth your time is a huge long shot. If I hadn't have looted the dungeons, I would have been done in 40 hours or less, but looting is a huge component of the dungeon crawl experience, a critical one. And here, that critical component is interminable and boring. It's the campaign's greatest failing by a big margin, lack of creativity being the runner-up in general. What's funny is that this failure to make looting compelling is a feature of the main campaign and not Neverwinter Nights in general. You can do it differently, and after going through all of these disappointing timer bars, you'll have had time to think of a half dozen better ways to do it yourself. But this, this is the default. The default says roll the loot table to determine your loot. Is it fun? No, but it's the damn rules. To navigate this rule-driven world, you need practical solutions. A thief is practical. The idea is that a total fidelity to these systems will allow for the same creativity of interacting with the systems as a tabletop game. But there are concessions. A party of two makes massive sacrifices in agency over the Baldur's Gate model, but also increases mechanical challenge. You're not down there to solve interpersonal problems, you're down there to fight monsters and open chests. If you're not playing online with friends, there's one guy for that, your old pal Tommy. Only Tommy isn't remotely real as a person or a character, he's a can opener with a backstory. You can't talk to him much, he talks to you based on predetermined triggers. You can choose someone else, but you give up massive conveniences in navigating what makes up most of the actual gameplay experience. You can't even say to him, Tom, for one fucking night, would you just cool it with the accent, like you might in person? The single companion system is Bioware's most awkward, underwhelming approach to the traditional tabletop party in their catalog. They abandon it, and amend it, in favor of something more interesting as soon as you hit the expansions. But in the meantime, 
Tommy is what happens when you try to design a role-playing game adventure based on a manual instead of on a module. It's in the open construction of the second and third acts, though, that the game finds an independent identity. It hadn't been since the original Baldur's Gate that so much effort was spent on meandering, low-impact outdoor space. What that captures is the sense of possibility and lurking adventure that much more modern, open-world games build on as a foundation. The first act, in Neverwinter, is a real slog, difficult on account of the low level of the protagonist, with most of your time spent swinging and not connecting with anything in combat, but also claustrophobic in the minuscule focus of each district. Here's your two hours of zombies, your two hours of pirates, your two hours of escaped prisoners and miscellaneous bandits. By the time you get to the second act and realize you have these huge unknown areas in every cardinal direction from the hub town, it is joyfully liberating. It's these local vignettes where the game sometimes does coalesce into a memorable nugget of storytelling. Like the town of Charwood Village. It's been frozen in time, deep in the forest. One night, long ago, all the children disappeared into a nearby castle and never returned. Then the centuries began to blend together for the townsfolk. The celestial powers have determined what happened within the castle as a crime against existence, but would like a mortal to judge what happened exactly. There's two witness-slash-suspects interview and a surprise third suspect in the form of a powerful demon that you can summon and question. You need the testimony of all three for a, a positive outcome. Your judgment will determine if the souls of Charwood find agony or peace. It's rich, engaging storytelling, if only for a moment. Venturing deeper and deeper into moody twilight forests filled with monsters and mysteries, that's good. The engine might be dated, but it honestly does a better job with the outdoors than it does with the indoors. The light and the foliage from gently falling leaves to grass that sways in the breeze helps slightly disguise what an undecorated stone hallway doesn't about the fundamental from-template construction of all of these maps. The game's distance fog, artificial and pointless indoors, actually does help set the scene outdoors. Now, all the outdoor environments are built on obvious elevation tiers, with bottomless canyons and flat-top hills. They're just as much bolted-together hardware store sets as the rest of it, but here it's something where creative effort was put into, into it to counter the artificiality. For dungeons, the right-angled mazes are part of the intended experience as well. Used to be, people would make their D&D maps on graph paper, and this is meant to capture that particular thrill, not the effort to make something convincingly naturalistic, but the effort to make something artificially, structurally crafty, a better mousetrap for the players. And that's the thing that's ultimately so exhausting about the game. The main campaign is essentially a celebration of the format of Dungeons & Dragons, and so its elements are all self-justified in a way that strips them of, of a lot of meaning. There are a lot of dungeons out there in the woods, some even with a quest attached, but they're there because it's assumed that I like them by default. You go down and into the caves and you kill an orc chieftain, then you kill a troll chieftain, and then you kill a bugbear chieftain. Any one would do, but different enemy, enemy types for different level ranges, so kill them all! There's a dozen too many crypts in the game, but they're full of loot and opportunities for paladin and priest characters to shine, so pile them on! The game's laziness of writing hits a peak when they do a whole series of quests where the local troops are poisoning an indigenous tribe with plague blankets and then justifying their hostilities when the tribe lashes out. I mean, there's phoning it in, and then there's using famous historical war crimes as filler content. Not to mention the, uh, you know, literal reptilian conspiracy that makes up the main plot. The best vignette material, the most creative side quests that you'll find out in the deep wilderness surrounding the city of Neverwinter, are all relatively self-contained. A story well told is equally as mechanically valuable, or maybe less to Neverwinter Nights, than a dungeon crawl through, through troll tunnels. Little of it makes an impact besides experience points and loot. But looking back, it's those moments like Charwood that I actually remember. Of 80 hours of play, I had maybe 10 that stood out. The rest quickly fade, receding into fog and unloaded from memory like everything else more than 50 feet from where the player is standing. Neverwinter Nights doesn't see its landscape in terms of traditional art, like the fixed perspective isometrics did with their lush, hand-drawn backgrounds. It sees it like the Dungeon Master always has instead, lines on the graph paper that become, with the application of human imagination, so much more than that. Often the details of a room or a place in the game are communicated through text more than through the 3D assets, 
What you see isn't exactly what's meant to be there. What you see is the board and the figures on the board. They're representative of a more detailed, more nuanced full image that's built inside the mind still. That's why the old isometrics preferenced story so heavily. If the imagination is already running at speed from just the words alone, the images and the emotional investment and the general believability of the narrative all elevate the action up and away from 2D sprites on a screen. With Neverwinter Nights, the shift from 2D to 3D tried to make the world seem more concrete and less imaginative. The swords spark and clink, the camera pans in any direction, the world is less obviously a painting. The approach is more technically sophisticated in the programming and more technically minded in the play experience. But the 3D is so rudimentary that the imagination is required to pick up most of the slack anyway, and without the character-driven world building that made that load an easy one to lift in games past. Refer again to Mass Effect Andromeda. The story is half-hearted and cliché like this one, but the experience flies by a lot quicker and a lot smoother because of all the pretty shiny things in the grand sci-fi vistas. It doesn't do a good job of firing the imagination, but it does do a good job of being cool to look at and numbly enjoyable in its core mechanical loops of shooting and pressing the use key. The main campaign back here in 2002 is more rote and derivative than Mass Effect Andromeda by a good margin, and yet the 3D world has close to nothing to distract from that visually. In fact, you're given ample time to consider what other games you could be playing while you wait for another locked chest in another sparsely decorated room to be popped open by our old pal Tommy. When even the dungeons are boring, the game is a true digital purgatory. Not truly awful, not remotely good, with no seeming beginning or end. The dungeons, though, can be well considered and have obviously received the most creative attention out of anything in the campaign. In the third act, there's a dungeon with a time travel gimmick, with one version of the dungeon in the past and one in the present. Swapping back and forth is required to navigate it. Here in 2018, and you've got games like Dishonored 2 that pull the same trick better, of course, but the trick sure is a good one, and opening the puzzle box of the dungeon is just as satisfying in this older configuration. With an actual party of characters I was invested in, it would be perfect. But it's just me and Tommy in our own private production of No Exit. I kill the monsters, and he slowly disarms and unlocks the path ahead, over and over, until the end of time. It's worth comparing Neverwinter Nights' main campaign to Knights of the Old Republic, which Bioware would release the following summer. Knights uses a d20 system almost exactly like 3rd edition D&D, and mechanically speaking, they are very similar games. It's a 3D world arranged according to the old isometric structures. Knights of the Old Republic uses the previous Bioware model of party-driven, dialogue-focused progression and a much tighter, more selective approach to designing the levels and presenting itself generally. There are six worlds to go to in Knights of the Old Republic, each one distinct with a rich local plotline that ties back to and progresses the main plot. By contrast, Neverwinter Nights has at least three times the amount of physical space as Knights of the Old Republic, with half the variation in environment, and half the density of quests and dialogue. Sure, most dungeons have quests, but they're almost either, Bring me the head of Chief Whoever, or I've lost my magical suppositories, or something else that involves little player choice. In fact, the opportunities for actual role-playing are few and far between. Your options for a quest are usually yes, enthusiastic yes, no, and a persuade roll to get 200 extra gold for saying yes. Everything people complained about regarding the simplification of role-playing between Fallout 2 and 3, or New Vegas and Fallout 4, also happened here, within the Bioware catalog. But the novelty of 3D and the reprioritization towards combat and dungeoneering were enough to lead many people to forgive it. A PC Gamer review from the time refers to the story as one of, quote, sweeping grandeur. And I wonder what kind of mindset you'd have to be in to feel that way about it. Even by the standards of Icewind Dale, this is a come down in quality. Take the game's most important NPC, Lady Arabeth. You begin the game in a Hero's Academy, which is a blatant excuse to have mandatory tutorials for the first half hour of the game. When Hero School gets out, you graduate, and Arabeth hands you your Adventurer's Diploma. But a complication arises, so she sets you on a path to find the creatures stolen from the Academy, which will help cure a plague in the city, etc., etc. Arabeth is married to Fenthic, a naive good guy elf who's pals with Dester, a priest of Helm who is obviously visibly a villain. So, by the end of the first act, Fenthic laid it all on the line to help his buddy Dester, you know, with his important secret ritual which he chose not to ask questions about. Little does Fenthic know about the reptilian conspiracy. 
So when the act is over, Fenthic is sentenced to death alongside Dester. In the second act, this makes Lady Arabeth very sad. She's a paladin, lawful good. She must abide by the justice that took her husband. By the end of the second act, she's been turned to the dark side, I'm sorry, to chaotic evil, becomes a blackguard, which is the reverse paladin prestige class for third edition, and now works for the Lizard Queen. This is all apparently because she loved Fenthic so much, you see, and what even is justice if a well-meaning elf like him, etc., etc. There's a phrase among players for people who play lawful good in a way that is irritating for everyone and makes no narrative sense, called lawful stupid. This is Lady Arabeth from head to toe. Her internal conflict only exists because she's apparently unable to be a nuanced enough character to deal with Fenthic's poor judgment without violating the alignment of her character class. If a player were to ask the dungeon master in this campaign, can I be mad about Fenthic and still be a paladin? The DM would say, obviously, of course, and the game would continue, but this whole plot, the longest running plot thread in the game, is completely dependent on a fundamentalist interpretation of lawful good as one that can't even question lawful action. Arabeth continually acts like a first-time player might play a paladin, saccharinely good, inflexible in perspective, sent into melodramatic fits by even a hint of moral gray. If you've gotten her backstory during Act 2, it's possible to redeem her in Act 3, but even that feels hollow since her character's arc is so flat and irritating. You're making a persuade role on what ought to be common sense. Arabeth is a character who, like the others, seems to come from a generalized example in the core rulebooks more than a specific example in an adventure module or a Forgotten Realms novel. Arabeth is a narrative built from the rule that says that paladins cannot level up in their class if their alignment shifts away from lawful good. Her late act self is a template for how to use the Blackguard prestige class in a campaign for your character or an NPC you might have in mind. If she was an illustration in the core rulebook, a brief paragraph of text in italics, her story would be perfectly serviceable. But this is a big deal Bioware campaign. Her story is strung out across hours and hours of play, three acts. Arabeth, to me, underlines more than anything else that the main campaign of Neverwinter Nights is a vestigial, peripheral thing to what Neverwinter Nights really is. It's an attempt to translate the game of Dungeons and Dragons, the dice and the graft paper and the rules, where Baldur's Gate was much more an attempt to translate the experience of Dungeons and Dragons. The main campaign is devoid of personality almost by design to show an example of a game with a truly impartial digital dungeon master and deliberately familiar motifs. The generic plot, the generic gameplay, the generic characters, these are just examples of what the game can do. Neverwinter Nights is more. It's a platform. It's a toolbox. All these elements of plot, quest design, level design, they're reconfigurable assets like the doors, like the hallways. The game is a great stack of creative firewood, all in a tidy pile and surrounded by kindling. But it'll take a spark of something more than what's provided to actually set it alight and warm yourself by the flame. The first expansion, Shadows of Undrentide, was developed mostly by a smaller studio called Floodgate Entertainment. You can tell right away, while the expansion mimics much of the three-act structure of the main campaign, at every juncture it presents itself with more personality and creativity than anything in Bioware's default template campaign. Shadows of Undertide has an authentic feeling of a human dungeon master, not some impartial digital one. It's willing to tell jokes, provide convenient weapons, offer multiple solutions, and best of all, it has companion characters that are actually tied to the greater arc of the story. More than that, though, is that the game has a kind of casual feel to it, not breaking the fourth wall in obvious ways, but more willing to be playful with its cliches and less likely to, to present them straightforwardly. From the beginning, it presents an alternate vision of the rough structure of the original campaign. You begin, at level one, in a hero's academy, but not an institutional generalized one. You're one of several students of renowned adventurer Master Drogon. One night, Drogon is poisoned by a mysterious assailant, and even though you are not ready, your final test will be to leave Drogon's school for the greater wilderness and find a way to save him. Not only is this more engaging than, thanks for completing the tutorial, here is your hero's diploma, it puts the player right in rural adventuring mode, the mode that was the most satisfying, exciting thing about the second and third acts of the main campaign. The original campaign's choice to keep the player inside Neverwinter for the early levels made the difficulty of low-level D&D more pronounced than it has to be, because it was all hallways and dungeons. 
Once you were released into the greater world, you were already at a level that let you utilize your class in a comprehensive way, sure. But the fun of low-level D&D is that you just aren't much good at anything yet. You're fragile and clumsy, and as such, the scale of your conflicts are smaller and the victories more surprising. Baldur's Gate 1 was built very specifically around only the low levels, and it made adventuring through all that seemingly inconsequential wilderness feel much more dangerous, filled with greater possibility. Shadows of Undertide immediately leans into that feeling, taking the player from levels 1 to 8 or so across a sprawling first act in a snowy forest. But even in the first hour, there's more to pull you in than the main campaign. Your companion is chosen from the other students, depending on what class you'd like, and while each is grounded in a fantasy archetype, they all feel a little more specific in their personalities than Tommy and the crew. Dorna Trapspringer is this expansion's thief, and she's actually a very likable character. She's as green as you are to start, and her arc of the story runs on the same curve as the player characters, affected by the same events. Sure, she does always push for a profit angle, but she's got a core goodness that does make her likable, and none of what she says or does is unreasonable within the setting. More, she doesn't tell rambling stories of wacky hijinks from outside the scope of the story. There's not a huge difference in creativity required to write a cliché character like Tommy, who's completely interchangeable into nearly any story, and a cliché character like Dorna, who's definitively tied to a single place in time, but the difference in making the effort to ground a character in what's actually going on is huge. That might seem like storytelling 101, but Neverwinter Nights was a widely acclaimed and highly reviewed product that didn't even make that effort with companion characters. It's the low point on the whole Bioware catalog for dialogue writing, and they never went so flatly generic again, so lesson clearly learned, but you put the expansion and the original campaigns next to each other, and man, the little alterations stack up into what's both a damning indictment of autopilot fantasy writing and a celebration of what a personal touch small studios can bring to a story when given a turn in the spotlight. The end of the first act has you fighting a dragon at way too low a level, and instead of being a big mechanical obstacle, it's a pretty damn funny puzzle instead. So there's a kobold named Deacon. He's real good at playing guitar. The little guy's a kobold bard, and he's got an important piece of the puzzle about what happened to Drogon, but he'll only tell you if you free him from the dragon who owns him. Now you can bargain for Deacon, or while questing on the opposite side of the forest, you can acquire an artifact that will turn you, for a time, into a frost giant which the dragon happens to have a phobia about. In the main campaign, you only encounter dragons when you're high enough level to slay them, or else have opportunities to go and get those levels, then come back pretty quick. Here, the dragon is a conundrum in the way a dragon so often used to be treated in the tabletop setting, something you'd be an idiot for facing head-on. You'll have to outsmart it, grovel before it, or take a gamble on powerful magic to defeat it. Finding the solution means exploring the forest thoroughly and engaging with a majority of the other content in the act. And it all feels so fun and so free. The experience and loot flows quickly and freely, and each diversion is worthwhile to explore. Each element of the game world feels deliberately crafted, many item and character descriptions including little jokes or some element of casual absurdity, while still not really breaking the thematic integrity of the fantasy setting. It's like with a human DM. Some people are just a little more casual and jokey with their players than others, freer with the loot, quicker with the rewards. A DM who's more likely to laugh along with a player's harebrained scheme than to sourly command them to make an immediate dexterity check. In comparison to Bioware's style, including the better fantasy of Baldur's Gate, Floodgate's effort feels very much like that friendly, fun-loving DM. Take this scene with the dragon's other kobold servants. There's a giant stone head blocking the path, and only the kobolds can raise it with a bucket contraption. Once you earn their favor and their command stick, the kobolds will line up, jump off a cliff into the bucket, and slowly fill the bucket with their scaly little bodies in order to open the passage. This is a lot of fun for the kobolds. They love this shit. It's one of the most willfully goofy things I've ever seen in an official D&D campaign, and Shadows of Undertide is filled with smaller moments of whimsy a lot like it. And it works because the game isn't completely goofy. When it counts, it takes the emotional lives of its characters quite seriously. There are moments of doubt, friendship, and sacrifice that land better than any of the main campaign's melodrama. It works because the creative effort is there to bond the player to the characters. You laugh with them, you fight with them, you worry with them. What makes a worthwhile D&D game? Is it rolling dice? Is it telling stories? It's never really either one in isolation. The mark of a good campaign is the smoothness of how well a writer or developer or dungeon master can blend the raw mechanics of D&D with the human dimensions of its world building.
The dragon and the winter woods are just the first act, anyway. Shadows of Undertide is a hefty piece of content, a true expansion pack from the days when post-release material had to be large enough to merit a standalone retail release of its own. Once Drogon is cured and back on his feet, the real chase begins. Drogon's attackers are fleeing deep into the Anorak Desert with a powerful artifact and nefarious intent. Bad news, right? The second act shakes up the structure of the game again, pivoting from a hub town surrounded by a freeform wilderness to a funnel journey across the desert. You'll make three stops on the way to your destination, some planned, some not, and the journey can't continue until these local concerns are addressed. You'll be attacked by scorpion people who make you fight a manticore in an arena deep beneath the sands. You'll defeat an ancient mummy whose zombie minions have fouled a sacred oasis. You'll bargain with drunk archaeologists and raid a dozen tombs yourself. It's a different flavor of environment and a different pace of adventure from anything Neverwinter Nights had offered so far, leaving behind the stock standard Tolkien-esque world to head into the Forgotten Realm's other, weirder locales. The Forgotten Realm setting is pretty huge, actually, and encompasses a wide variety of influences and aesthetics in its different regions. The games are often set around the Sword Coast, but there are thousands of miles further out to set stories in. As we go along, we'll start to see more and more of that in the various modules. Shadows of Undertide is the first one to use the most generic part of the setting just as the springboard for a grander adventure on a more ambitious scale. The second act has fantastic momentum to it because of the vignette format. The player's in the mid-levels now, getting exciting loot and fighting weirder monsters appropriate to that power level. The deeper you get into the far reaches of the desert, the more prepared you feel. Rogan was right. You're gonna be okay. At the same point of the main campaign, you were still fighting orcs to check off fetch quests and score randomly generated loot. At the end of the second act here, you found an ancient city under the sands, Netheril, the greatest magical empire of all history, which had cities that floated in the sky. Then, one day, the magic was interrupted. All magic everywhere, and the cities fell to the ground and shattered. Drogon's lost artifact will restore one, Undrentide, to the sky. You get there just barely, barely too late to stop it. Drogon sacrifices himself so you can keep going and stop the plot before the city can be used to bring havoc to the realms. So the third act, then, is all dungeon as you navigate the city and try to break into its control rooms. There are old golems, deadly traps, and the secrets of a lost, evil, magic civilization to boot. It's just fucking great. And now you're in the 12 to 18 range for levels, your peak capability for dealing with danger. So danger is what you get in great heaping fistfuls. Every act in Shadows of Undertide is tied to the ideal kind of pacing and encounter difficulty for D&D's level ranges. Each part of the story is mechanically and environmentally distinct, and each step of the way feels full of promise and possibility. When I thought to myself, maybe I'll play Neverwinter Nights again, almost all of my memories turned out to be from Shadows of Undertide. It's got that spark, the little bright flash of creativity that turns a game into an adventure. If the main campaign was essentially a demo for what the engine and toolset of Neverwinter Nights is capable of, Shadows of Undertide was proof that the underlying foundation was a solid one after all. With the technical structure of the base game and the creative flesh of the expansion, the potential of the game was becoming more readily visible. The second retail expansion, Hordes of the Underdark, proves the creative flexibility of Neverwinter Nights by going even farther afield than either of its predecessors, into the epic level range beyond 20, and even beyond the material plane of Faerun, into the cosmological backstage of Dungeons & Dragons' Great Wheel. Hordes of the Underdark is a full Bioware production, but more wild and experimental than anything they did the first time around with Neverwinter Nights' main campaign. Strangely, it even seems to acknowledge the first game's awkward and lackluster writing at a few different points, and in varying degrees of self-criticism. The first is that in choosing a player character whose story to continue, Hordes of the Underdark strongly preferences continuing your character from Shadows of Undrentide. Many conversations assume a familiarity with Deacon the Kobold Bard, for instance. Deacon will even give you a book he wrote about your adventures together in Shadows of Undrentide, and when he asks you what you thought of the book, you can say that at least it was better than the hero of Neverwinter's story. We're two expansions deep and a year and a half after the initial release. We can laugh about it now, can't we? So the game starts off with a vision of a drow priestess in full maximum camp costume and an assassin at your room in the inn. But instead of setting its sights outward to another open-ended wilderness romp, the expansion sends you down into the realm of Undermountain, playground of the mad wizard Halaster. Halaster is basically a jackass version of Elminster. The drow are planning something characteristically nasty, and you've got to go down and figure out what the deal is with that. 
Hordes of the Underdark walks an interesting tonal balance. On the one hand, it is nearly as self-aware as Shadows of Undertide as being primarily high fantasy camp, not to be taken entirely seriously. On the other hand, it uses the unpredictable, utterly blown out power curve of epic level Dungeons and Dragons adventuring to continually escalate the stakes higher and higher, to widen the scale of the world more and more, until it becomes hard to not take what you're doing seriously on account of the raw audacity of it all. The key is in the escalation, the slow-boiling absurdity. Undermountain is a series of difficult, deadly dungeons leading ever downward. It's not really free or open the way other campaigns are in their first acts, but the dungeoneering is much harsher and more engaging. You're long past orc chieftains. Now you're into that real bizarre, extremely dangerous part of the monster manual where you're fighting giant gelatinous cubes and undead dragons. So the first act is comfortable and unambitious within the world-building and action verbs of the game. It's just a dungeon crawl, albeit a denser and more unpredictable dungeon crawl than you've seen before. The funny thing about epic level dungeon design, though, is that since the player is getting near godlike in their class's capabilities and well-leveled into one of the many prestige classes which provide even greater edge, not every combat encounter is necessarily dangerous. So puzzles come into greater focus, and most levels of the Undermountain pivot on a central puzzle or combination lock of some sort. Getting to the bottom of Undermountain is an act of besting one of Bioware's most intricate dungeons, the Watcher's Keep of the new 3D approach. And the dungeon is just the appetizer. The first act ends with you liberating Halaster from the drow, but since he's kind of a dick, he repays you by binding you to a magical spell requiring you to kill the Valshares, the scenery-chewing elf from the cutscenes. You begin Act 2 in a settlement of nice drow, followers of Eliastri. From here, you'll branch out into the Underdark with as much freedom as anything in the main campaign, a huge and sprawling act with six major quests, each containing multi-level dungeons and their own side quests. When you went into the Underdark in Baldur's Gate 2, it was in the upper mid-levels. You were wildly outclassed by most things, especially beholders. The Baldur dungeon here is just as brutal, but since it's designed at the epic level, it's got a much bigger population and a much more patently unfair climax fight. For those who enjoy the mechanical challenges of 3rd edition, Hordes of the Underdark delivers dungeons and scenarios meant to flex the most powerful spells and abilities that characters have, using routinely the ninth level magic that before was only seen around the very climax of an adventure. The Underdark is a well-chosen setting for epic level content on account of its whole thematic composition. Everything down here is menacing, evil, ominous. Sailing quiet underground oceans lit by algae, trying to match wits with an illithid elder brain in its very own city, unraveling the cult of an ancient and demonic enemy. Any direction you choose has a detailed and dense subplot to investigate and conquer. The anonymous, vague fetch quests of the original campaign give way entirely to exciting story hooks and imaginative twists, even in quests that do seem at first to be mundane. The companion system continues to improve. You can have two at once now, and all the companions in the expansion have extensive and frequent conversations with you. In the first act, they even brought back companions from the original campaign, like, you know, fucking Tommy Undergallows. But this time, even his voice actor seems to know to cool it a little bit, and he's much more even keeled, and maybe even slightly more believable as a character than his original configuration. A change of the guard in the writers is partially responsible. This game was one of the first that David Gator was lead writer on. Gator would go on to be lead writer on Dragon Age Origins, and especially Dragon Age 2. He even wrote novels in the Dragon Age universe. But before all that, he did the final official Bioware expansion for Neverwinter Nights. That is one of the really interesting things about revisiting these old titles. The adventures aren't just engaging as D&D games, they're like discovering the early albums of bands you like, where the sounds are less produced and the ideas are more haphazard, but the vibe is still recognizable, even in its creatively larval stage. Neverwinter Nights is intimately connected to the greater history of Western RPGs, but not in flashy, huge ways. It's full of references to games that came before, with elements that preface design choices and writing priorities in games yet to come. The games may not be classic, exactly, but the closer you look, the more important they do seem to become. The hinge between one style of writing and another can be seen by a glance through the companions. It's not just that Tommy's chilled out and matured a bit, it's that the game stopped treating him as a general idea of a character, wacky halfling thief, and added the basic emotional truth that no one can maintain that kind of energy level and momentum forever. Hence, a more professional and quiet Tommy. He's been a hero for a while, that makes it harder for him to be a scoundrel. 
And then Deacon, especially. Deacon is, on the surface, every bit the novelty character, a Jar Jar Binkshish figure, unless you take him straightforwardly, that he's one of what's considered a mindless, foolish species who feels genuine curiosity about the world and expresses it through art, through his music. In telling his bard's tales of heroes, Deacon came to emulate the archetype. Honest, courageous, helpful. Deacon is a hero because he set his mind to it and didn't let anyone tell him different, even though everyone constantly belittled him and laughed at him. To have Deacon here as an epic-level companion means that Deacon is a more accomplished adventurer than most ever become, but he's still humble and goofy in genuinely endearing ways. Deacon reminds me of one of my dogs, a little blue healer who puts her ears down and her tail between her legs when she's confused and worried by something silly like the vacuum cleaner, but then always leaps up to bark her guts out and pursue anything she perceives of as real danger, like shapes in the darkness beyond a campfire. Deacon's acknowledgement phrase, a hesitant, um, okay, has become kind of a meme between my wife and I with this dog of ours. It's in that way that Deacon is likable. He's got the utter, earnest loyalty and goofy companionship of a dog, combined with the wits and opposable thumbs that allow him to be a real adventurer, like the tall folk. Deacon's kind of a low-key mascot character for, for the franchise, too, appearing also in Neverwinter Nights 2. But the apex of his journey is in the Undermountain, out of his depth, and hesitantly optimistic anyway. It would have been so easy to boil Deacon down to shtick like the companions of the original campaign, but Hordes of the Underdark took him seriously, more seriously than you'd think maybe you ought to, and in doing so made him feel real. Or real enough for D&D, anyway. The new companions, two ideologically opposed drow, are with you through the second and third act, and feel almost ahead of their time in how they challenge the player's ambitions and assumptions in the party dialogue. But the most surprising and even shocking bits of companion writing are reserved for none other than Lady Arabeth, whose soul is trapped in the frozen hell of Kenya for what she did in the events of the main campaign. She isn't even a significant part of the third act, just a stop on the way to completing a larger quest, and there's little guarantee that she'll actually come with you. But in going over the events of the main campaign, she tells you a revisionist account of events that put her whole character in a new light. She says that when she got here, Mephistopheles, lord of this hell, knew her deepest secret and damned her with it. The secret that she never loved Fenthic at all. Her overreactions, her absurd treason, they weren't melodrama over the events in front of her, but a hidden anguish over the knowledge that she didn't want to be who she was. She hated herself. Pious, sanctimonious Arabeth was a front to hide her existential discomfort. So when Fenthic died, she didn't turn evil out of mourning. She turned because she'd kind of always wanted to, because the despair she gave into was an old wound deep enough to fall into and never come out. Here, in hell, all this seems distant to her now. She recounts it with a wry sadness that's more humanizing than literally anything she ever said or did in the main campaign. Hordes of the Underdark does a great job at what you do expect, at epic-level adventure and intricate dungeoneering, but it does an even better job at things you'd never expect, like taking the saddest rags of the original campaign's plot and weaving them into something bright and eye-catching and new. The structure of the second act has you organizing a defense for the Eliastri believers, while dismantling the Valshares' armies piece by piece. If you spend too much time bouncing back and forth, the battle will come before you've had a chance to do it all. But it doesn't matter how much you do, because at the end of the second act, which feels so thoroughly climactic, you're killed without hardly an effort by Mephistopheles and damned to the hell of Kenya. Escaping hell is the surprise third act. And man, is it ever a surprise. This final third of the expansion is, in many ways, a love letter to Planescape Torment. Even though Planescape didn't make the transition from AD&D to third edition, the cosmology did. They even throw in a ton of sigil slang, like Burke, Clueless, etc. Sometimes it feels a little excessive, but when the game does things like have a deadly ancient black dragon tend bar at the tavern, and sends you off to learn the true names of demons from an ancient creature with the body of a butterfly and the head of a woman, the tone certainly feels pretty Planescape. It's kind of striking to trace the path of what novelty is to the player and the player character across the two expansion packs. In Shadows of Undrantide, it was neat that the woods had snow, and it wasn't the same old late spring of the original tile set. You started out being vexed by kobolds, and here you are breaking out of the coldest part of hell. The actually coldest part of hell. That's the kind of bizarre thrill of following a single D&D character across the whole power spectrum into the epic levels. The escalations of conflict start to become absolutely preposterous given enough time, loot, and experience points. 
By this level in Baldur's Gate, you're on the cusp of actual godhood, the child of Baal in all their horrifying glory. While the first act of Hordes of the Underdark was Dungeon Puzzler, and the second act was a surprise open world, this third act even mimics the level design of the isometrics by presenting a dense, hub-oriented series of environments, more dependent on dialogue than combat or exploration. Your main quest is even peculiar in that old Planescape kind of way, where there's a celestial with knowledge you seek who is sleeping a magical sleep until he finds his true soulmate, the woman the universe literally intended for him. To wake him, you cross his acolyte and she can die in the conflict. When you finally reach the knower of names, you can learn the identity of his true love. Now, I've read that this can actually vary from person to person. Sometimes it's even the player character or one of the player's companions. But for me, it was a tragic answer. His acolyte, the one who died to stop me from waking him, was the one he was waiting to see. Her devotion was true. When I returned, I told the sleeping man what had happened, and he attacked me. I feel like that was a valid response, but I had worlds to save, so I killed him too. In the epilogue, it tracked this outcome and commented on how bards would be inspired by the bitter tragedy of it all for decades to come. The Sleeping Man quest represents a massive amount of development effort poured into a weird late-game quest in a weird niche-appeal expansion pack. There's no reason that this quest should have been so reactive and varied other than the satisfaction of having made a quest that both mechanically and thematically does live up to the legacy of design of Planescape Torment. And in this particular instance, they sure did. Neverwinter Nights can be dumber than a bag of hammers, depending on what campaign you're doing, or just how boring the game is being at any given moment, but Hordes of the Underdark has this one wildly complicated, willfully weird tribute to some of the best <coughs> writing of all time in RPGs, and that makes it impossible to write off the game as pure pulp and pure nonsense. The complexity of options extends into the climax, too. Have you had the mind and the money to do so, the knower of names can tell you Mephistopheles' true name. You can skip the final boss battle and cast one of the most powerful beings in the Dungeons & Dragons universe back to hell with a quick word and a snap of your goddamn fingers. Day saved, mischief managed. Hordes of the Underdark is an incredibly fitting end to the primary run of campaigns in this way. The original campaign showed what can be done with the software of Neverwinter Nights, and then Shadows of Underntide showed how it can be done better and with heart. Hordes of the Underdark's sneaky and surprising escalation show that there really is no limit to the kinds of stories you can tell with the tools provided, even stories in long-gone settings like Planescape. You can do whatever you like. You can start with kobolds, and then end with the eighth hell of Bator. The Baldur's Gate games were better stories in most every way, but they were only one story. Neverwinter Nights can be a thousand. The final retail expansion for Neverwinter Nights wasn't just one story either, it was three. Strangely, none of them take place in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. In 2004, Bioware launched a digital storefront, and Neverwinter Nights became an experimental kitchen for them to cook up what was one of the first successful DLC patterns from a major developer. New adventures would be released as premium modules, an official stamp of approval to set some of the highest quality modules aside from the bulk of user-made content, and sell them for cash money. The first three premium modules were collected in a retail package named after the lengthiest adventure of the three, Kingmaker. For many, Hordes of the Underdark is where they parted ways with Neverwinter Nights, but for those intrigued by the lingering possibilities of what storytelling could still be done with a rapidly aging Neverwinter Nights platform, premium modules would be continually released all the way into 2006. The first of them is called Witch's Wake, and it's a fascinating module to start with because of the mismatch between ambition and reality on display within it. You see, Witch's Wake isn't just a generic D&D alternative to the Forgotten Realms, it's a completely new setting that one of Neverwinter Nights' lead designers for multiplayer, Rob Bartell, came up with. In an extensive interview with online magazine Wild Surge, Bartell talks about how one of his pet projects for the Bioware Live team that handled multiplayer and post-release content was to do weekly tech demos demonstrating what the engine was capable of. Wizards of the Coast told them at the time, in 2002, that they could release whatever they liked so long as it wasn't a Forgotten Realms campaign and didn't need to go through a Wizards of the Coast approval process. Hence, all the premium modules of Kingmaker are either original settings or variants on generic D&D. Witch's Wake, though, was the very first, and was originally released by Bartell as a tech demo for what kind of storytelling was possible within the Aurora Engine toolset. This was still in 2002, long before the premium module program even existed. 
Bartel says in the interview that community modders were skeptical that the engine could support a sophisticated kind of narrative presentation using the base tools provided. So Bartel puts this incredibly sharp, condensed piece of storytelling together and releases it for free as part of the live team's ongoing effort to encourage the multiplayer and modding communities. Bartel said in the interview that the game's opening, where the player awakes with no knowledge of who they are and a dim memory of battle, is a nod to Planescape Torment, and that Torment influenced him quite a bit. Well, Witch's Wake isn't just a nod to Torment. It's an experiment in mood that draws from Torment to not only set its stage, but also paint the characters and guide the tone. Witch's Wake showed, before the expansion packs ever did, that Neverwinter Nights could be many things beyond the traditional, generic fantasy. The module is only part one of an intended five, but after Kingmaker, Wizards of the Coast had changed their mind about content. Now, the live team could do anything they wanted so long as it was a Forgotten Realms campaign and did go through the official approval process. All the subsequent modules after the Kingmaker 3 are set in the realms, and a module with sci-fi elements called Hexcoda had to be cancelled. Witches Wake sequels were not permitted because of this agreement. In one way, that plays to the strengths of the toolset. It was designed for the realms, after all. But in another way, it's a clear creative handicap after playing something as wild and free as Witch's Wake. Bartell describes the decision to only hire one voice actress to do the narration as a cost-saving one, but that choice ends up being the most stylish thing about the module. Witch's Wake begins with the dim sounds of battle and your kingdom's prince dying next to you as you both bleed out into the snow. Magical tendrils of black ooze swirl from holes in the ground. Something is deeply wrong. A woman's voice narrates it all in a gentle, moody tone that deepens the sense of mystery. An old woman, a rag picker, finds you there in the snow, and you begin the adventure by looting the corpses of the battlefield and burying the prince's body. She suggests that you go and seek out the night hag. Of course, the rag picker is the night hag. The amnesia is the obvious torment tribute, but Witch's Wake's main NPC is also clearly a riff on Ravel Puzzlewell. And that's okay, she's a great character, and the module does well by trying to thieve a little of her legacy. Most things in the environment, tombstones, vistas, characters, are all narrated by the same distant, airy voice with its promise of shared secrets. It's the voice of the witch and the voice of the world both. The module's final revelation, after tracking down a fellow survivor from the battlefield, is that your army had gone to kill the night hag. The prince's dying message, tell the king she is dead, it's the witch he was referring to. And yet, here she is, not only helping you, but telling you the secrets of the Plain of Sorrow, giving you access to a hidden place perched above the River Styx to retreat to should you die. With that knowledge, and a cryptic message about the fields of battle lying in the hearts of men, the module ends. Across five modules, perhaps the single narrator might wear out its welcome, but with just this tiny slice of story, and the witch woven throughout as dungeon master, NPC, and guide, it feels like a fever dream told by the witch herself. There are just a couple little side quests in a single town, and even then the biggest thing to do in the town is visit a museum that tells some of the history of Bartell's new setting. Every bit of Witch's Wake feels professional, the first chapter of a truly grand adventure in a bizarre dark world. And then it just ends. All that effort, all that setup, no payoff. This is the flip side of the creativity coin with Neverwinter Nights. Yes, it can act as a platform for tremendous creativity within the limits of the tool set, but finding the time to actually make that creative vision manifest is another thing entirely. How many tabletop campaigns meet the same fate? How many dungeon masters have kingdoms and worlds and stories that will never see the light of day? Some of the best fantasy stories ever written could be the ones sitting half-finished in spiral ring notebooks stuffed into the back of drawers of, of desks the world over, but we'll never know. So far, simulating D&D has been about simulating the game when it works as intended, but Witch's Wake inadvertently captures one of the most common frustrations and failures that D&D brings with it. The massive over-preparing for a thing that never actually comes together. Maybe you do a session where your amazing new setting goes through its introductory steps and everyone's really on board with it, but then, well, Dan's hard to get a hold of since he got promoted, and then there's Angie's wedding coming up, I guess, and Friday's not going to work for anyone, what with the freeway shutdowns, and Christ, there's a lot of emails here I haven't read, and that is it for the world you made. For Witch's Wake, it was Wizards of the Coast that put a stop to it, but anyone who's ever seen a beautiful campaign dissolve out from underneath them for mundane, everyday reasons can certainly relate to the feeling. The ambition on display here is spectacular. And as part one of a story that'll never be finished, that ambition is preserved in amber, a coiled spring that never finds release. 
The second premium module, Shadowguard by Ben McJunkin, is also part one of a grander adventure that was never finished, but where Witch's Wake had a clever enough hook to warrant a brand new setting and the promise of future installments, Shadowguard is kind of rote and basic fantasy storytelling whose cleverness mostly lies in the pacing and structure of the module itself. Before I read about the initial requirement that modules couldn't be Forgotten Realms adventures, I had wondered why Shadowguard had bothered with an independent setting at all. The setup is solid. Your character narrates their backstory as the only child, either son or daughter, of one of the top men of the Empire. Outside the Empire, the Crimson Prophet gathers his forces. The game picks up at your graduation from the Imperial Academy with a ritual where you judge a soul to either be condemned to the hell that awaits it, or to be pulled aside and bound to the material world as extra punishment. It's strange, an unusual dilemma even by these things by how these things usually play out, and suggests some more interesting cosmology to come. Your father misses the ceremony, and a surprisingly large amount of early dialogue gives you a chance to articulate your character's relationship with their father. Is it broken and distant? Sycophantic? Tense? There's a good amount of role-playing to be done, and the module rewards you for playing alignment, and is even mindful to shift your alignment if you don't. Towards the end of the module, you finally do meet with your father, who's been in tense diplomatic negotiations all day. Not only did he miss your graduation, he missed an attempt on your life besides. Everything seems to be loosening at the seams for the Empire, but in this conversation, you're given a sincere apology and a chance to repair the rift between the two of you. That moment of closure is how you know he's about to die, of course, but the amount of detail and depth put into grounding your character in the world is more than you'd think of from a one-off like this. The majority of the module is spent meeting members of the Shadow Guard, an organization that honestly doesn't seem that much different than the Harpers. The four that you meet are all clever, attractive, adventuring types that are obviously being built up into the core of the story yet to come. But dividing the tasks this way, you get the sense of a very busy, well-populated city from which the quests actually radiate. Looking back, the quests were pretty much all main quests, with few side content. But the process of discovering and following the plot threads is extremely organic and satisfyingly freeform. When you've tied everything up satisfactorily and go to meet your father at your estate, your house explodes, killing all within. The Crimson Prophet steps out. The siege on the city has begun, it all falls apart, and all you and the Shadow Guard can do is fight through the burning city to their ship moored in the harbor. Shadow Guard is actually wonderful at articulating the feeling of this particular story beat in a longer story, the calm before the storm and then the catalyzing disaster. You get to know the city well, and so it means something to see it burn. In the library, you might have even read some of the eight-volume set of setting history for extra context. Or not, because the setting doesn't matter so much like it did in Witch's Wake. Here, it's the feeling that matters, the escalation from curiosity to comfort to chaos that a calm before the sto storm story is built on. Shadow Guard didn't suggest it was going anywhere especially interesting in the plot, and I'm not put out that the story arc was never completed, but it did function well within the limits of the actual module. Had Shadow Guard been less ambitious, had it sought to tell a condensed and insulated story, it would have done itself a favor. Suppose the end of the module has the Crimson Prophet actually killing the player character. Suppose the module was oriented to be straight up tragedy from the beginning. That might have been sharper, more memorable. But instead it tries to mimic the scale of storytelling in the main campaign and the expansion, sprawling high fantasy adventure where the player character is too important to die like a lowly NPC. That's the thing about a tool set that promises unlimited storytelling. It is very tempting to aim higher than you have the strength to climb. Kingmaker by Dan Whiteside and Corey May is the longest and most technically impressive of the original three premium modules, and if it wasn't for the stylish and clever writing in Witch's Wake, I would say it was the best. It limits its ambitions more than Shadow Guard, and as such, gets going quicker and sticks in the mind better. It doesn't have an eight-volume history for the world, it's just regular old D&D in a homebrewed location, Cyan Keep. This is evocative of the kind of more casual world-building common to the tabletop game. The module begins with a discussion between an adventuring party besides. A weir rat thief, a fire gensai warrior, a Roxasha sorcerer, a manic depressive druid, all very strange character combinations that also evoke the kind of party a tabletop group might come up with under a very permissively wacky dungeon master. Neverwinter Nights 2, when it finally rolled out in 2006, let the player choose a much wider range of racial backgrounds than Neverwinter Nights 1, like tieflings and gensais and grey orcs and such, but in the first game you had more traditional choices for the most part. So in Kingmaker, your character is referred to as the normal one of the group. Of course, there's a secret about your past to unravel and all that good stuff. 
The way Kingmaker kicks off, though, really is distinct from the other content by how immediately and heavily it puts the player in the half-serious, half-jokey mood that you get with a room full of friends in the tabletop game. All the companions are given voice actors, too, and pretty good ones for the most part. The high point is the woman who voices the rock Sasha. She's got a delightfully amoral perspective on things that she delivers with a kind of sparkly familiarity. The low point is the Weir Rat Thief, who's actually an okay character, but whose vocal performance is just exhausting to listen to with its deliberate nasal sniveling. Frankly, though, it's fun to be able to even have opinions on the voice work when so much of the dialogue in all Neverwinter Nights content is just words on the screen. Like the insular, claustrophobic mood created by Witch's Wake's singular voice actor for narration and dialogue both, the voice of the Dungeon Master, Kingmaker's voice acting emphasizes the playfulness of personality on display in most D&D adventuring parties. One of the objects of creating a good character, after all, is to create someone who can be part of the larger ensemble of the party, who can contribute to the flow of storytelling in meaningful ways. That's one of the reasons Lawful Stupid is such a widespread annoyance. That perspective causes storytelling gridlock inside of most any group dynamic. Kingmaker's party are all in the chaotic good, chaotic neutral range, generally well-meaning but able to cause some mischief if it's mischief that's called for. Effectively, this means that however the player character wants things to go down, it seems pretty reasonable that most of the party would be agreeable to it. Here's the brilliant catch, though. All of you die in the first five minutes of the game, and you can only choose two of the four to come with you back to the material plane. There's even complications within this small interlude, like the fact that your druid actually does want to die, and there's a demon waiting to drag her to hell should you choose to release her spirit. She says she's the easiest choice, but she's by far the hardest because of this. Luckily, she's not real, and you can reload the module, so in the grand scheme of things, it's fine to pick whoever you prefer for mechanical or narrative reasons. But that's the thing about Kingmaker. Its structure and generalities are all well-worn and familiar cliches, but its details are often clever and engaging. Kingmaker also has one of the best structural concepts of all the premium modules because it's willing to recognize the common limitations of the premium module format. Namely, it is actually an obscene amount of work for just two or so people to make an adventure on par with the official expansion packs. If you followed the general pacing and depth of detail for the first two premium modules out to what might have been their intended conclusion, they would probably end up being as long as Shadows of Undrentide, if not longer, and there were so many dedicated professionals developing that expansion. So, Kingmaker creates this flagpole-like structure of a story, where there's an election to determine the ruler of Cyan Keep, and you must convince at least four of ten guilds to vote for you. And then the player spends the game hoisting themselves up the flagpole and flying themselves at the top. At the top, you get the climax dungeon and the module wraps up. What's interesting is that the election is triggered very easily and can often occur before you're ready. At the very least, it's close to impossible to actually get all ten guilds on your side. Each has an associated quest that caters to a particular class's strengths. There's dungeons to delve, bribes to make, mysteries to solve, even a love triangle you can resolve if you happen to buy a haunted mansion in the keep center. The latter one is actually the most complex bit of quest formatting in the module. First, you have to kill off the goblins to impress the leader of the trade guild. She'll sell you a haunted mansion in return since you know how to handle things, obviously. Inside the mansion is a trap door. You follow it, and then you overhear your primary rival in the election, preying on one of his maids. A dexterity check will allow you to snatch his signet ring. Now, previously, you met the leader of the military guild, and he told you there was no way he'd ever vote for you, but to come have a drink with him anyway. So you go out to the tavern, and he reveals that he used to be in love with your rival's wife. The wife happens to run the Nobles Guild. If you confront her with a ring and the hard evidence that her husband is a total shitheel, she'll drop him like a hot rock and give you her vote. Tell her that the military man still loves her, and then he'll give you a vote out of sheer gratitude. So that's halfway to your victory condition right there, and you've not only become a landowner, but won an incredible amount of renown and favor from one of the most powerful people in town besides. There are more straightforward quests, like the Priest's Guild requiring three Crusade checks and a thousand gold bribe, or the Hunter's Guild wanting the pelt of a manticore, but the fun of it is in having more than you can accomplish. There are a ton of solutions to Kingmaker, and all of them are satisfying in one way or another. By the time you get to the climax and its revelations, like how your talking sword is really the spirit of your grandfather and he's had a real good time getting to know you, it's hard not to feel curious about the stuff you missed. The first two modules were full of content you could squeeze the last drop and they would still leave you high and dry with their irresolvable cliffhangers. Kingmaker withholds some of itself each playthrough and stands absolutely complete as is. 
It's not that it's unambitious. For two people, Kingmaker is a hell of a lot. It's that Whiteside and May tempered their ambition enough to actually see it through to the end, and that put this module on the cover of the box. Which is why creator Rob Bartell did another major piece of DLC with the live team, the Pirates of the Sword Coast Premium Module. It's the first of the back three premium modules, after Wizards of the Coast reversed their opinion of what kind of content was acceptable, now demanding that it all take place in the Forgotten Realms. Released in 2005, it's the first of the premium modules to try and tackle the scale and pacing of adventure in the expansion packs with any success. It's shorter than Shadows of Underntide, even shorter again than Hordes of the Underdark, but is fully as long as one of the major acts of the main campaign, at around 15 hours or so. I honestly didn't think I'd like this module very much because Yar Pirates is such a gimmicky direction for a thing to go in, typically. The module distinguishes itself, though, by taking the root concept and absolutely running with it, piling on comically large complications to the point that your character begins with shore leave in Neverwinter's Docks District and ends by sailing a ghost ship full of the undead into the depths of Umberlee's underwater wet realm where the living cannot tread. Pirates of the Sword Coast makes the now extremely familiar graphics and gameplay of Neverwinter Nights refreshing again through constant, playful excess. It rarely goes exactly where you think it's going. It goes there and then two steps further into the realm of the truly ridiculous. Pirates of the Sword Coast accomplishes this scale of storytelling by heavily streamlining its progression. There are definitely side quests to be done, especially at the two hub areas, but they all feed a central purpose, and there are no real optional areas. The maps in the module are all quite large and take a while to churn through, making the pace slow enough to feel longer than the number of total maps might suggest. Like the opener. It's the docks district just like you saw it in the main campaign, but there's around two hours of stuff to be done there, from a side quest about a gang war from which you can nicely equip your character, to a lengthy conversation quest foreshadowing what's to come, where a member of your crew quits on the spot rather than load a mysterious statue into the hold of the ship. You also meet the villain of the module, a priestess of Umberley, who the player can, if they want, continually try to talk down from their schemes. When you meet her, though, she is being attacked in her room. You kill her assailants, but it turns out that those assailants were her former servants, who had just realized that she promised their wages to your ship's captain. Wage thievery is a pretty bad foot to start out on, but if you persist in treating her like she's just misguided, she'll bring your crew back to life at the end of the module. Treated with hostility, and you're all doomed to on death, just the creak of the boat and the rattle of your bones for the rest of eternity. That's a high price to pay, considering that the priestess really is just an awful person. But the long build-up to the split ending is well done structurally. One of the biggest things you'd have to find your way around to forgiving her for is killing your captain and tossing you overboard. You wash up on a remote island with no inventory. The idea of the sequence, fighting for basic survival while marooned, is sound. The execution, though, is very fiddly. Outside of a forest setting or the desert canyons of Shadows of Undertide, the, the inadequacy of the engine when it comes to rendering terrain comes into sharper relief. You're gathering sticks and stones and ichor from squat, doofy palm trees on levels one and two of a small outdoor maze. I'm 100% on board for what it's trying to do here, but you're left with an inventory half full of sticks that take a full five minutes to dump when you're done, and these kinds of fiddly interface-related frustrations add up quickly and sap the enjoyment from the sequence. However, once you arrive at civilization again at an island town, the structure of your tasks conforms better with what the toolset was designed to do in the first place, and the flow improves. It's not that creativity should be punished, it's that the practical limitations of the toolset and its focus on common adventuring verbs and not survival verbs trips up deviations from the norm, adding unnecessary layers of complication that the module designer has to work around and then mitigate. In Spindrift Town, you're tasked with finding a crew for a ship. There's like nine crew members you can recruit, but you've got to narrow it down to a top five. Being able to recruit so many in so small a space means you're chewing through new characters and side quests at a breakneck pace, a major shift from the methodical exploration of being marooned. This is where I really started to warm to the module, as the variety of pirates and pirate archetypes they're able to cram into the two maps is very colorful. Some of it's willfully stupid, like the pirate Whipped Willigan is married to the governor's daughter and has ever since been forced to be respectable. To recruit him, you have to steal his weapons and armor from downstairs while avoiding his family. It's dumbass pirate nonsense on par with that who's chasing who animatronic on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Other pirates include a minotaur and a so-called noble pirate who the other ones make great fun of. 
This is also where treasure maps are introduced, a scavenger hunt mechanic encouraging you to seek out landmarks such and such a number of paces in a certain direction away from the last one. None of it is marked on the minimap, so you have to stop and reread the directions from the treasure map itself as an item, which feels appropriate. By the time your crew is put together, you journey to the Isle of the Dead to perform a ritual the captain says will allow you to reach Fiddler's Green, the underwater realm of Umberley. The Isle of the Dead uses fog and ghosts to disguise the island's shape more than earlier maps, giving it greater believability and sense of place. In the distant fog, broken ships litter the coastline. The treasure hunt here takes you to all four corners of the island and then the center. When you're done, the captain betrays you and turns you all into the undead. It's so campy, but brazenly campy, to the point that when it winks at you, it's just hard not to smile and wink back. Pirates of the Sword Coast is a full campaign, the first true campaign of the premium modules. It's unlike anything before it in, to in tone or structure, helmed by a developer who knew better than anyone what had and hadn't been tried yet at this point with Neverwinter Nights 1 and the Aurora engine. It's that personal touch and that consideration of what still counts as novelty that makes going deeper and deeper into the back catalog of Neverwinter Nights so enjoyable. Martel also worked on the fifth premium module, but this one reflects his deep familiarity with Neverwinter Nights as a technical work and not necessarily as a creative one. This module is Infinite Dungeons, a random dungeon generator that can take multiple characters on a journey from levels 1 to 20 and beyond in dungeons that can be tailored for appropriateness to their class selection and experience level. On the one hand, this is kind of a staggering thing to have actually work within the Aurora engine. The dungeons are massive, interconnected things filled with puzzles and rudimentary, randomly generated quests. It even peppers in camps to rest in and merchants to trade with, within the frame of the Realm of Undermountain, which you journeyed through in the first act of Hordes of the Underdark. I'm very impressed with the customizability of the dungeons. I'm impressed by its scaling range. I'm impressed by the fact that it does cohesively hold together, and it never crashed on me once. The thing is, this module references Planescape Torment in a completely different way than Witch's Wake. In Torment, there's a little artifact of a Modron, a being of pure law. Manipulate his little feet and wings, and you're sent into a randomly generated dungeon constructed by the Modrons to study the impulse of adventure. Why do it? It doesn't, on the surface of it, make sense as a generalized concept. Risk your life for golden items to help you risk your life for more gold and more items? What's the deal with that? And so the Modron maze has items like a note that says on one side, a clue, and on the other says, you understand better what's going on. That's what adventure is like, right? Clues, and items, and enemies, and s stuff. But none of it actually means anything, and it can go on, well, infinitely. There's not a lot getting around the fact that Infinite Dungeons is a next-generation Modron maze, and the Modron maze was meant on some level as a good-natured critique of hack-and-slash Dungeons & Dragons play. This module is a bit of a marvel in terms of scripting, but when it comes to the human experience, this is, no question, some kind of hell for me personally. Everything I didn't like about the main campaign, like autopilot dialogue, dungeons for the sake of just having dungeons, and excessive waiting around for traps and locks to be disarmed, is in abundance here. Once, a quest-giving imp told me, no joke, that it was important to a friend of his that I go a map transition up and touch an urn. That's it. Urn fondled, quest completed. Some of the puzzles are actually excellent, though, and I wondered how many puzzles there are total and if they scale and level along with the enemies. I can't be sure, though. This is the only module that I bailed on early. I played a dungeon, then I called it quits. We are now eight official adventures deep into Neverwinter Nights 1, and at this point, the idea of doing anything without a finite structure and a real climax gives me a weary headache. I've read that some people have happily put in a hundred hours or more into this module with various character classes. I believe absolutely that that is possible, and for some people even possibly enjoyable, but for me, the Modron Maze was a cautionary tale, and not a model for engagement. In May 2006, the Premium Module program was cancelled ahead of the upcoming Neverwinter Nights 2 from Obsidian. This left what many regard as the most impressive Premium Module, Darkness Over Daggerford, orphaned with no warning just weeks before it was due to come out. Developer Ossian Studios released it for free that August anyway, but here's the amazing thing. This past year, in 2018, the developer Beamdog released an updated version of Neverwinter Nights, their enhanced edition. Beamdog has decided to carry over most of the premium modules as modern DLC. Right now, it's three bucks a pop for Pirates of the Sword Coast, Infinite Dungeons, and Wyvern Crown of Cormir, the surprise sixth premium module that we'll talk about in a moment. 
Beamdog is also currently offering Darkness over Daggerford at a whopping $10. It's an updated, rehabilitated version that Ossian says features over 500 bug fixes and general improvements. I'm playing the 2006 version here because I began this project before the Enhanced Edition came out, and I figured I might as well keep doing the games in their original form. But make no mistake, this is an amazing, unique story in video game development. Ossian made something truly heartfelt and hefty, and then they were massively screwed by publisher Atari, who were responsible for canning the program. Twelve years later. Twelve years. And Ossian is given a chance by Beamdog to perfect their original vision and have it released as a true expansion pack, the most premium of the premium modules as far as the enhanced edition is concerned. So what makes Darkness Over Daggerford so special? Well, more than anything else, it's the module's uncanny sense for hitting the tonal and structural high notes of Baldur's Gate 1. It's much more than simply reusing motifs and organizations, more than Daggerford being just down the road from Baldur's Gate geographically. There's a whimsy to the dialogue, a conversational kind of banter between player and NPC that's got a lot more heart to it than the kind of transactional dialogue of the original campaign or the expositional lore-heavy dialogue of many of the subsequent modules. Ossian Studios set out from the beginning to make a soft sequel to Baldur's Gate, which company founder and lead designer Alan Miranda talked about in a 2006 interview with Sorcerers.net. Quote, My goal from the start had been to make a game with a Baldur's Gate 1 feel, and my approach focused on exploration, which involved having a world map and large, intriguing areas to discover. Each team member then brought their own favorite things from Baldur's Gate to Daggerford. For example, our writers wrote heaps of dialogue for some very colorful characters, which resembled the conversations you had in Baldur's Gate. We also put in a lot of effort into designing very fresh and creative D&D quests, which was also something you saw a lot of in Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2. Aside from that, there were never any specific step-by-step -step plans for imitating Baldur's Gate. It more or less flowed from our knowledge and instinct. Keep in mind that this was Ossian's first RPG game, as Baldur's Gate 1 was Bioware, so there's something magical to be said about the creative electricity and anxiety surrounding first projects." End quote. It's modest to say that this all flowed from knowledge and instinct, but more than that, it's fascinating to consider how well such a casual approach worked out when you compare it to the deliberate Baldur's Gate throwback Beamdog did ten years after Darkness over Daggerford when they released Siege of Dragonspear. Siege of Dragonspear just felt too damn modern in the end. Its structure was too streamlined, its companions too talkative. It was a good adventure, but it was awkwardly stuck between several eras of game design. It was fascinating to me to play Darkness over Daggerford, because it was like discovering a missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to figuring out why Beamdog's expansion fell short of the mark. I think a lot of it comes down to what Miranda said about the electricity of first projects. Siege of Dragonspear had a tremendous weight of nostalgic baggage, and a lot of creative handicaps as a middle chapter of a story that had originally skipped that whole interval of time. There was no way for Siege of Dragonspear to be Beamdog's game, the way that Darkness over Dra Daggerford is Ossian's game. Beamdog's expansion was burdened with having to take the specifics of what they liked about Baldur's Gate, specific characters, specific story beats, specific locations, and use them in ways that felt fresh. Darkness Over Daggerford deals mostly with a generalized impression of Baldur's Gate 1, with evoking the feeling more than connecting the dots. Plus, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 are structurally and tonally quite different games, and Siege didn't seem to quite know how to bridge them with its linear approach. It was an act of deliberate, nostalgic recreation long after a moment had passed, and like so often happens in Dungeons & Dragons, summoning the spirits of the dead and forgotten did have its complications. Darkness Over Daggerford isn't an act of replication so much as an act of tribute, a game that stands alone as an independent creative work, but with hundreds of little connections and remembrances and callbacks that bring up the feeling of the original work, better than an attempt to roughly replicate the material. That was the bitterly disappointing things about a thing about Neverwinter just playing the main campaign after having already played the Baldur's Gate games. There was a hope that Bioware could make the transition from 2D to 3D and still hold on to the particular creative flavor of those early games that persisted despite hour after bland hour to, of proof to the contrary in the main campaign. Especially in the second and third acts, there was a feeling that if only you could marry the wide-open 3D space of Neverwinter Nights with the imagination and class of Baldur's Gate, well, you'd have something special and something lasting. So far, each expansion and premium module had done something more and more interesting with the Aurora engine, had edged the game in different creative directions, and explored a multitude of storytelling and dungeoneering styles, yet none had captured that truly old-school feeling. 
Some of that was certainly the rush to establish an independent personality for the expansion or the module. Darkness over Daggerford is standard, mid-level, high fantasy along the Sword Coast's rivers, forests, and beaches. It doesn't have an immediate hook or gimmick like Kingmaker or Pirates of the Sword Coast. The things that make it stand out are smaller and more cumulative. It's in the player dialogue, which is the best of any modular expansion. Even in achingly mundane situations, of which there are few, the player can respond in ways that either foster role-playing by representing different motivations and perspectives, or contribute to the immersion by allowing the player to make jokes, or behave with deference, or be snide without immediately provoking combat. Too often, player dialogue is written without much personality to allow the player to project better onto a blanker slate. But Baldur's Gate, and even more so Planescape Torment, weren't afraid to let the player character be an independent character, to let them speak naturally and conversationally, even at the slight expense of player control over the specifics of the conversation. In effect, this allows a player to be surprised by the things that they might be able to say. In Mass Effect, you were likely going to choose either red or blue, and you knew that before you even started talking. Here in Darkness Over Daggerford, or the old-school isometrics from which it draws inspiration, I never know how an interaction will go beforehand unless it's like a troll on a bridge, and even then the game, the game might lay me down a real zinger on the troll before the combat begins. In a nostalgic work like Siege of Dragonspear, you know what you're going to get because it's trying to give you that second helping of whatever it was the first time. In an adaptive, referential work like Daggerford, the looser it holds onto the s'mores material, the tighter its grip on the ability to still deliver novelty and surprise. To put it another way, Siege of Dragonspear adapted Baldur's Gate by emphasizing detail over structure, and its real strength was in making those minute connections of plot and background details. Darkness over Daggerford has a structure that's much more immediately recognizable as Baldur's Gate, with its world map and interconnected wilderness areas full of detailed side quests. In terms of detailed reference, Alan Miranda seems especially fond of the fact that both Baldur's Gate 1 and Darkness Over Daggerford have very complicated talking chicken quests. He mentions it in at least two interviews. And damned if his talking chicken quest isn't intense. A whole circle of druids has been turned into birds, and you have to rescue all four, one after another, each with its own unique skill challenge or extended joke. It's a half-hour side quest based on nothing more than a pun about being stricken with a foul curse. Yet, the adventuring is enjoyable. It's, more, it's a more creative scavenger hunt than most previous Neverwinter content, like the treasure maps in Pirates of the Sword Coast. The jokes are awful, but grinningly awful in an elbow-nudging way that got me laughing despite myself. I mean, all the stock-standard self-serious druid dialogue being interrupted with involuntary squawks and clucks is just knee-slappingly excellent after module after module that would have just presented the same kind of conversation straightforwardly. This is what I mean by structure over detail. The only shared detail is the assumption that a talking chicken in the wilderness is worth investigating, but the shared structure is to have side quests with unexpectedly branching detail and deep interactivity, where, where skills and character build has bearing in how the quest goes down, even in the retrieval of errant penguins. In the original Baldur's Gate, the massive majority of the game world was unrelated to the main plot, and only by adventuring through each large wilderness map could the mosaic of the world map be fully unlocked. The world map here in Darkness Over Daggerford is smaller, but the module does the exact same thing, with about the same quest density of two to six side quests per optional area, depending on size. The scale of adventure, like the literal scale of mountains and mileage and area traveled, is almost exactly the same as Baldur's Gate. Even seemingly dull setups have complicated payoffs, like a story about a gnomish family who makes cheese. A younger member of the family wants to convert to ranching for beef. As this quest develops, you guard a caravan of cheese against bandits, witness a double cross, uncover an agent of the Iron Throne, the organization Servok founded in Baldur's Gate 1, and then have an opportunity to either kill the agent or run a double cross yourself. Like the cheese quest, I didn't expect much from Darkness over Dragonford when I first saw it. This was the twelfth of fourteen adventures I cover in this video that I played, and I was sure getting tired of orcs and elves. I was wrong to prejudge its surface simplicity. Darkness over Daggerford was much longer, much more complicated, and much more interactive and reactive, and ultimately much more fun than I have expected from something so utterly obscure and neglected. Having played it, I find myself excited by the fact that the Enhanced Edition has singled it out as being hefty enough of creativity and content to be priced at $10 12 years after its publication. 
The original edition is still available if you're short the $10, but in a certain way, price is status when it comes to video games on a marketplace like Steam. A lot of indie games feel like they can't price themselves higher than even $5 or so, and spending $10 on an unknown developer with an unknown title can feel like a hell of a gamble most times. To have priced Darkness Over Daggerford at the price of a full piece of modern DLC, at the same price as something like Mass Effect 3's Citadel, legitimizes Darkness Over Daggerford in a way that had previously eluded it. It's always had something of a cult classic status within the Neverwinter Nights community, but in terms of broader reach, it was, for all its professionalism, still a mod and not an expansion. It relied on word of mouth. But now, its price speaks for it, too. More than any of the other premium modules, more by a concrete $7, Darkness Over Daggerford is a game worth revisiting. It's better than Shadows of Undrentide by a huge margin. It takes the humor that was on display there and tempers it, working in more types of humor and less fourth wall stuff, resulting in more of a high fantasy tight five than the basement jokesterism of your longtime DM. It's better than Shadows of Undertide at controlling its scale, too, doing an adventure of levels 8 to 16 and not the ridiculously long and fast curve of 1 to 18 in roughly the same time frame. I think Darkness Over Daggerford might even be more total maps than Shadows of Undertide. The only difference is that when Shadows of Undertide came out, Neverwinter Nights was still just a year old, and when Darkness Over Daggerford came out, it was four years old, with an official sequel just months away. Daggerford ought to have been treated as an expansion in its own right. So much more impressive in scale and execution is it than the premium module counterparts. And now, it is. Darkness Over Daggerford is a game that illustrates, in a really comprehensive, concrete way, how arbitrary a process it can be for what stories and experiences become canonized in pop culture and which ones slip through the cracks. The barriers to entry for newer, smaller developers in overcoming an ocean of competition in a perpetually skeptical consumer base are massive. That's one of the things that makes these modules so enduringly fascinating. For every developer in the premium module program, this was a shot at the big time. Not right away, of course, but a popular release with a Wizards of the Coast pedigree opens doors. Gaming's history barely even remembers their time at bat nowadays. Darkness Over Daggerford's Enhanced Edition Steam release has, at the time of this writing, just six user reviews. Its release was favorably noted by many gaming sites, but not explored in any detail besides a brief, by the way, this happened. Darkness Over Daggerford, like Neverwinter Nights as a whole, isn't much of a classic, but it sure does feel like one, and in another roll of history's dice, maybe things would have been different that way. The way things did go is stranger still, because Atari made an exception a month after Darkness Over Daggerford was released for free, and added the Wyvern Crown of Cormier into the Premium Module catalog months after the Premium Module program was officially cancelled. It was a weird kind of snub for Daggerford. Wyvern Crown of Cormier is an amazing module, certainly the most extensive and complex of the official six, but it's only about two-thirds the length of Daggerford, and its storytelling is not nearly as creative. Atari, for its part, priced Wyvern Crown at a whopping $12 and kept it there until the premium module authentication servers were shut down in 2015. It was, for the original release, what Daggerford was to the Enhanced Edition, the most premium of the premiums, the final and greatest of the official content. Wyvern Crown of Cormier is the crowning achievement of a modders collective called DLA, or the Dragonlance Alliance. They rose to prominence in the modders community, adapting the Dragonlance setting to the Neverwinter toolset. Dragonlance is a creative universe you don't see much of in video games, but per the agreement with Wizards of the Coast, the post-2004 modules had to be Forgotten Realms Adventures. So although the DLA gained a lot of professional credibility when Bioware tapped them to do the premium module, it came at the expense of the setting that brought them together in the first place. I'm not that familiar with Dragonlance myself, but I suspect it might help explain some of the tonal differences in world building between Wyver Wyvern Crown and the other mods. By contrast to the previous ones, it's got a much more medieval Renaissance Fair kind of vibe compared to the Tolkien-esque high fantasy of the majority of Forgotten Realms content. Now, that's either a function of the local culture of Cormier, which is a little more legalistic than most nations, or a function of the storytelling habits of Dragonlance aficionados. Riven Crown is kind of noteworthy for how faithful it is to the customs of Cormier, even going so far as to incorporate the law requiring adventuring parties to have a registered charter into the plot. The setup is well-worn as a story, but different from the others in the premium module program by virtue of how traditional a sword and sorcery story it is, the basic beats of the narrative almost certainly predating Dungeons & Dragons itself. 
Your family's farm is destroyed by brigands in the opening moments. You and your brother had been away in the woods when it happened. As common folk, you can only hope to venture to see the Lord of Thunderstone and appeal to the nobles for justice. The nobles, of course, do not wish to hear your peasant's complaint. So you ride in the joust and claim victory, and in doing so, qualify to become the Lord's squire. As a squire, you investigate the brigands. As your investigations bear fruit, you become knighted. As a knight, you can avenge your family and rally the kingdom. But not before a final climactic joust against your brother, who is now turned evil and riding in the joust disguised as the Black Knight. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but riding in a joust against your nemesis, the Black Knight, is such an ancient cliché that it even got it turned into an episode-long Family Guy routine in 2001. Here in Wyvern Crown of Cormier, you get to live out this feudal rags-to-riches story without even so much as a hint of satire. It's a little strange, to be honest, especially compared to Darkness Over Daggerford, but also compared to much of the expansion and premium content, Wyvern Crown is mostly humorless. The dialogue isn't aimed toward the player at getting their laughter or their curiosity outside of the context of the story at hand. The dialogue is aimed squarely at the player character, and never breaks the fourth wall to suggest that maybe this is all a little familiar, or even present an absurd element for absurdism's sake. Reverend Crown presents Cormier and the City of Thunderstone in a completely sober, straightforward, grounded way. Even for the realms, it's a little weird. Ed Greenwood, setting creator, is known for being extremely whimsical in his novels, and R.A. Salvatore is continually exploring cultures like the Drow, who have customs that creatively range far beyond dukes and knights and the pageantry of two dudes riding horses at each other with big wooden poles. This simplicity and earnestness ends up working in the game's favor, though. This is the ninth official adventure for Neverwinter Nights, tenth if you count Daggerford, and to still be able to establish an independent creative identity in a novel tone at this latest stage in the game's shelf life is no small feat. Although jousting may be kind of silly on the face of it, something you might see in Las Vegas if you happen to be drunk enough in the right casino, playing it so straight and refusing to abide by any snickering or talkback from the NPCs or player character makes it hard not to get caught up in the actual intricacy of the sport, which Wyvern Crown spent what must be an enormous amount of time implementing in real depth and complexity. It took me over ten minutes to read and understand the in-game instruction manual for it, and even then I barely got it until after I had seen a joust or two. There are points on the opponent's shield you aim for, which you then augment with a riding style and seat position. Depending on how your opponent has chosen to ride, his shield target and his seat position, you either get a point for a solid blow, no points for glancing blows, or no points for a miss. If you get knocked off, that's three points to the opponent who knocked you. Three points wins a match. So it's either a war of attrition over several bouts, or a dramatic dehorsing in a single round. It's actually a lot of fun, weirdly strategic, and there are so many little details they added, like opposing riders making comments to you as you ride back to your start positions after a bout that doesn't result in an overall win. You can customize your horse, customize the colors you ride under, it is just flat out the finest jousting ever seen in a licensed Dungeons & Dragons product, possibly the greatest digital jousting since, well, ever, since Joust the Arcade Cabinet does its thing with flying ostriches. And that is something that a larger game with a higher profile simply would never have been able to get away with. There was a furor earlier this month about fans being angry that certain puddles in the new Spider-Man game weren't as large as in demo builds. What do you suppose those people would say if a role-playing game came out and the developers were like, yeah, we spent a quarter of our development resources on faithfully implementing a medieval sport? What of it? Fucking blood in the streets, man. Obscurity was a license to make game design choices that emphasize things you might not expect. For all its creativity, Darkness Over Daggerford was a deliberate Baldur's Gate throwback. Bourbon Crown of Cormier is singular. Nothing quite like it before or since in the official catalog. Its position as an extremely late addition to the Neverwinter Nights canon meant that those deviations from expected design, the sheer self-indulgence of it, were major positives for a novelty-hungry audience who were perhaps getting weary of Ed Greenwoodisms. For its part, Wyvern Crown of Cormier's Thunderstone is every bit as large and dense a place in terms of quest content as Daggerford. The rural areas, though, are mostly done in linear order and feature few side quests of their own. The module itself is confidently paced because of it. It builds its momentum, deviates little, and then climaxes with the player leading a massive assault on the Witch Lord's army outside an ancient barrow in the deep woods. In a way, it is fitting that the premium module program ended on Wyvern Crown of Cormier. It's a tight, professional work with a unique feel and look, but it's also getting back to the root clichés of the main campaign, circling around the most creative deviations of past modules and arriving back at the satisfying portrayals of stock standard fantasy tropes that characterize the original campaign.
Reverend Crown of Cormier was surpassed in size and complexity not just by Darkness over Daggerford, but by increasing numbers of community modules. It took a long time and many updates to the toolset for the greatest ambitions of the user base to bear fruit, but eventually they did. For some people, the release of the enhanced edition of Neverwinter Nights in 2018 must have been a bit of a head-scratcher. Wasn't that just a boring older Bioware game from back in the day? Well, no. The platform provided by the Aurora toolset did for RPGs what the Gold Source engine of Half-Life did for shooters. It made practical development tools available for anyone with time, patience, and vision. The premium module module program might have been cancelled in 2006, and Atari might have moved on to Neverwinter Nights 2, but the community continued to tinker and dream. I've limited the scope of this video to just the official releases, and it's still taken me nearly a year to get through what I've done here. This video, if I included other user modules, could be 10 hours long, 20 hours long, 100 hours long. The Enhanced Edition is meant to future-proof the community, to provide a version of the game that will be stable on modern systems for the years to come, so that the vision of Neverwinter Nights as a platform, as the ink and the pages and the binding for the stories of others, can persist through time. There are servers that act as miniature MMOs. There are servers for doing a constellation of custom-made, seldom-seen adventures. There are servers for pornographic roleplay. The game is many things to many people, and will continue to be that way for as long as operating systems support it. Wyvern Crown of Cormier is like the main campaign, and it makes it feel okay to let it go and move past it, to embrace the even more obscure creative works that do it better. So, the premium module program ended. So what? There's 16 years of free stuff, weirder and wilder and more successfully experimental, than anything passed through the Wizards of the Coast approval process. When Wyvern Crown came out, there were fewer than six weeks left before Neverwinter Nights 2 released. But when it did, the game would invert the design philosophy of the original game. Neverwinter Nights 2 is almost all about the official content. Its toolset was harder to use and demonstrably much, much less popular. Its lack of user-friendliness actually helped sustain the Neverwinter Nights 1 community by failing to give them a seaworthy ship to jump to. And so, we go together into 2019 with Darkness Over Daggerford on the sales floor for the first time and a new lease on life for the original game, while Neverwinter Nights 2 remains shoved so far back in the Obsidian catalog, you gotta make a spot check to notice that it's there. I think one of the things that really throws people about Neverwinter Nights 2 is that Obsidian and Bioware have the opposite dynamic within the franchise that they usually do. Typically it'll be Bioware or maybe Bethesda that does the time-tested, relatively safe thing, and then Obsidian will go off and do a weird variant or a thematic deconstruction of it. This time, Bioware broke the mold of what we expected its role-playing games to look like and sound like with Neverwinter Nights 1, and then Obsidian tried to correct backwards the other direction by offering an extremely traditional, predictable Forgotten Realms experience with a party of four talkative companions and heaping gobs of dialogue. Neverwinter Nights 2 is still trying to address the shortcomings that the premium modules had already spent so much time addressing when it comes to the base original game, shortcomings in writing and reactivity and player agency. As a result, Neverwinter Nights 2 is a tremendous improvement over Neverwinter Nights 1, and its expansions as well if you stack up Mask of the Betrayer against Hordes of the Underdark and stack Storm of Zahir against Shadows of Undertide, but it doesn't quite ever get experimental or playful with the Forgotten Realm setting in the way that you might expect from Obsidian. Knights of the Old Republic 2, after all, was an incredible and bold reevaluation of the entire system, the entire value system of the previous game, and of the Star Wars universe in general. By contrast, this is like if Knights of the Old Republic 2 had omitted every moment of cynicism and doubt and replaced it with cantina banter. It's kind of amazing how uncritical the whole game is, considering the developer. By the time we get to the expansion, that'll change, but the main campaign of Neverwinter Nights 2 is, in many ways, every bit as by the numbers as the main campaign of Neverwinter Nights 1. The difference, as we've seen, is in personality and style. Neverwinter Nights 2 emphasizes companionship and group dynamics more than anything in any Neverwinter Nights 1 module, featuring nearly a dozen recruitable companions with big personalities and extensive backstories. Their dialogue may be, be cliché, but there's a certain kind of joy in it, of writing dialogue and quests within a format of a traditional Forgotten Realms adventure. Fantasy pulp is the object of the exercise, and so the effort is there to make the pulp as delicious as possible. The fact that there isn't any catch, any hidden layer of subversion, leads a lot of people to call this Obsidian's worst game. I disagree. It's not their strongest, but it's arguably one of their largest games, only really dwarfed by Fallout New Vegas. The scale of the thing, and the success with which they execute the story over such a long time frame, is impressive. It may not recall Baldur's Gate in its writing, but it does recall Baldur's Gate in the execution of a grand arc for the player's journey, from basement de-ratting to godhood. 
There are well over 100 novels in the Forgotten Realms setting. Not all of them are going to be great, but most of them are going to be fun. Most of them are going to be, on some level, comforting. This is where Neverwinter Nights 2 fits into the canon of digital role-playing. Not as a classic, genre-defining work that gets reprinted every few years, but as the paperback with a title obscured by creases in the spine, taken off the shelf and opened up again once every few years or so, when the rain is really coming down, and the idea of getting anything important on that day seems preposterous. A lot of my affection for the game is rooted in what basically amounts to its tutorial, the bright and beautiful afternoon of the West Harbor Harvest Fair. You, having lived an entirely uneventful life in the town under the care of your distant foster father, Dagon, are teaming up with your friends Bevel and Amy to win the Harvest Cup. There are four games. They teach basic melee combat, basic ranged combat, basic magic, basic thief skills. The framing of all these things, though, as harmless games of the fair, is what really catches my eye. There's truly a small town feeling to the whole thing, of everyone knowing everyone for a long time and having an appreciation for both the strengths and failings of their neighbors. You, your player character, belongs here in West Harbor. There's even small town gossip about a harvest fair many years back when a famous rivalry between a man named Cormac and a man named Lauren came to a head. You'll meet both these people in the journey to come, but in the meantime, there's just this carefree afternoon where the worst thing that happens is the disenchantment of an enormous pig to return it to regular size. It's pastoral peaceful. It's easy to roll your eyes at such a thing, but this moment is an important moment in a story at the epic scale. The end of the beginning, the moment when the days stop blurring into one another, and the shape of destiny begins to trace itself on the characters' faces. You don't begin at some stupid hero's academy like you came out of a dispensing machine for adventurers. No, you have a home, a good home, and in another hour's playtime, you'll have to leave it for the safety of everyone. One of the best things Baldur's Gate did was starting you off on a similar final day of innocence kind of moment. Candlekeep and Gorion were touchstones for grounding the player's journey all the way through the end of Throne of Baal. West Harbor isn't as significant as Candlekeep to its story, but the lesson was well learned, and it's just as effective here. This is part of what I mean about not being especially experimental, but being deeply satisfying in hitting the narrative notes it does hit. When things go wrong and West Harbor is attacked, Amy dies. She wasn't being set up as a companion after all. This way, the story can bear some teeth early and make sure the player feels the weight of leaving. Bevel, your other friend, goes with you to your first dungeon, but Dagon prevents him from going any further with you as a companion. You're tough enough to be an adventurer. Bevel was just barely tough enough for West Harbor. Much, much later on, Bevel will become part of the staff of the castle you're given. You, him, a couple others. Very few of the people you meet at the Harvest Fair and in these introductory moments will actually survive through the end of the game. The game doesn't have to deliberately flash back to these moments to keep them in a the player's mind, either. It's an old adage that you can never go home again, and beyond the town simply being burnt down several times over, this kind of opener, in context with the long journey ahead, evokes one of the most elusive elements of childhood nostalgia. The melancholy that comes from knowing that nothing will ever reconstruct those past moments, and the further they recede into the past, the less real they seem to be. Winning the Harvest Cup isn't the first act of a hero, it's the last act of a child. There's a lot of emotion you can pack into that moment, because everyone has their own version of that moment, and all of them are sentimental powder kegs. That's part of what fantasy is good at, as a genre, exploring the idea of who people can be if they rise to the challenge that life gives them, seeing the humble become heroes, and seeing the cruel become villains. The thrill is in the process of becoming, experiences and experience points both, accumulating into someone more powerful and capable than they were when they started out. To answer that call to heroism is to abandon what's comfortable, to leave home. The more concrete a picture you have of what home is, the sharper the feeling when you put boot to trail and find out what comes next. Neverwinter Nights 2 starts building your permanent party immediately after you leave West Harbor. You'll meet Kelgar, a hard-drinking dwarf like almost any other hard-drinking dwarf. He likes fighting and drinking, and that's Kelgar. At first, anyway. The thing about the companions in Neverwinter Nights 2 is that they all present as familiar cliches at first, but unlike the original Neverwinter Nights, they actually do start to grow out of those cliches as you go along. Again, if you're used to Obsidian being more cynical in tone, it might feel a little weird to be so unapologetically archetypal with its characters. It might simply be that part of Dungeons & Dragons is enjoying the creative repetition, the familiarity of the different professions and races. For new players, these tropes can act as a guide to figuring out how to navigate these imaginative situations, and in the beginning, the clichés are useful to the learning curve. To begin an adventuring party as a group of routine clichés is a common low-level experience, but as players adventure together, they can respond in specific ways to specific circumstances, and thus color in the details of their character's personality based on concrete experience and not 
sort of vague idea. You don't know just who the characters will really be and what their significance in the story will be until you throw them all in the mix and shake it up a bit. Kelgar, for example, wants to be a monk. At first, it's simply because he envies their fighting prowess, but the abbot asks Kelgar to undertake a series of self-betterment quests. Some he completes by confronting his past and the rift he put between himself and his clan. Some he completes by realizing he fought better when motivated by justice and righteous anger instead of competitive bravado. By the end of it all, Kelgar becomes a much more believable, grounded character. It just takes time and a willingness to have patience that characters will develop if given time and space. That is the hope, anyway. Sometimes characters don't necessarily need an arc if they just fill a background role. The paladin Casavir, for example, is pretty much exactly who he appears to be, and any nuance is brought by the voice actor, who does give a winningly solemn performance. But paladins are always transparent. That's part of their shtick. It's okay. Less forgivable is Bishop, another obvious bad guy who does obvious bad guy things when the script requires it, and is just a total jackass the rest of the time. Bishop illustrates why parties are usually predominantly good or predominantly evil. The contrasting alignment just sticks out like a sore thumb, and is, on some level, almost required to throw wrenches into the gears of the, party pl the party's plans. Bishop is who he is, and there's nothing you can do about it besides throwing some occasional shade at him and leaving him out of the active party. But where Neverwinter Nights 1 gave you a single companion who had no bearing on the plot whatsoever, Neverwinter Nights 2 demands that you take every companion with you to be on hand for the events of the game, even if you don't actively choose them for your three companion slots. So, Bishop is mandatory, even if he sucks. Sucking is his purpose, really, to be a sullen foil for the jovial heroism of the other characters. The ensemble is carefully considered, balanced, weighted. Each character has a role to play, and not being able to much argue or amend those roles produces twists in the plot that feel, at best, confident, and, at worst, contrived. The second companion you meet, Nishka, is a good example of how the slowness of the character arcs can be very detrimental. Nishka is the first horns and tail tiefling thief since Anna from Planescape Torment in digital role-playing, but where they went tough with Anna, Nishka is more of a comic relief character. She's essentially a kleptomaniacal D&D version of Megan Mullally, and sometimes that actually does work well. The thing is, Nishka doesn't develop very much until quite literally the final room of the game. Her subplot is more about acceptance than change. For her side quest, she, acts, she asks you for help in out-thieving a rival, and nothing you say will persuade her from it. You can either encourage her or ignore her. In a certain way, this is solid writing, to have a character inflexible to the player's usual ear-bending charm. Sten in Dragon Age Origins is a good example. But with Nishka, the gimmicky parts of her per personality stand out so much because it's hard to not want her to change, just a little, at least. Seeing Kelgar discover deeping, deeper meaning in his capacity for violence is genuinely fun to see and be a part of, and Nishka is not afforded a similar journey. But at the very end of the game, it does pay off in interesting ways. The King of Shadows, the ultimate enemy of the game, tries to rile her demon blood and turn her against you. If you've been unkind or dismissive, it'll work. But if you've let Nishka be Nishka for all the mischief and inconvenience that might entail, she defies the magic and remains loyal to you. In letting her find her own voice in person, she has the strength to resist the call of her nature. It's suitably climactic, but does it take too long to get there in the absence of another arc? I can easily see that she might feel to some people like a Tommy Undergallows type, an over-talkative, mandatory pest, but that is the test of what there is of her character's arc in that final influence check. Can you get past that she might be annoying and treat her well anyway? The best way to appreciate Neverwinter Nights 2 is to try as best as you can to just get into the mood of it, to take it seriously even when maybe the game hasn't earned it. Take Chandran Amanjero, for example. Amanjero is the villain of the second act, a powerful mage with a sanctuary full of demons. Chandra is his granddaughter, a farmer you met back in Highcliff during Act 1. Amon is a ham, a murdering bastard with an all-around disagreeable personality. It turns out that you and he were both working against the King of Shadows all along, but that comes out only after he kills Chandra to try to thwart your plans to defeat him. Once he realizes what he's done, he joins your party in her place. He's still a jerk, but he is anguished over his fuck-up. Now, this is all melodramatic cheese for sure, but the game spends a lot of time and effort humanizing Chandra, even showing her reactivity to the player by having her testify at a trial either for or against you, depending on what kind of quest solution she'd witnessed you choosing. Chandra is more of a regular kind of person among adventurers, and at first she worries about her capabilities in the journey ahead, but by the time you get to the end of Act 2, she is truly strong in both her spirit and her sword arm. 
which is when Ammon kills her and there's nothing you can do about it. It's a contrived emotional circumstance, yes, plotted and telegraphed well in advance. But if you're willing to meet the game halfway and try to have sympathy for the arc of Chandra's journey, to appreciate the bravery of who she's become over the course of your travels, then the tragedy of the moment is there to share in, if you're willing. It might have the sophistication of airport fiction, but the books they sell in airports they sell because they're fast and fun and relatable enough to make people's flights go by without having to be very present for it. Creating comfort fiction is as much of a skill as boundary pushing is a skill. Neverwinter Nights 2 has very few moments that are surprising, and even fewer that are, that are subversive, but if it was a song, it'd be one that I'd find myself humming along to without even really realizing I was doing it. The three-act structure has a much grander overall feel to it than the first Neverwinter Nights as well, thanks to a lot more diversity in quest design than the collect four things to continue motif of the original game. After leaving West Harbor, there is a long journey to even get to Neverwinter, which features several optional areas and plenty of side quests. In many reviews, this is seen as a slow start. In general, I might agree, but it's also an important interval in the life of a Dungeons & Dragons character. The first five levels are always tough. Small challenges loom large. So having a several hour period of somewhat freeform wilderness questing makes a person feel accomplished and powerful when they finally do arrive in the city of Neverwinter. You also come up to the full four-person party with the addition of Eleni the Druid. You get some gold, you get some magic items, you fight some lizard folk in the swamp and some zombies in the graveyard. Good times had by all. Rather than getting clever with these more banal elements of D&D adventure, Obsidian seems to be celebrating them. They certainly could have gotten right to the point if they wanted to, but when you journey back through these areas in the third act and find them in dire situations, it wouldn't have the drama if you hadn't witnessed them in a moment of normality when you were feeling normal about it yourself in the first act. It's a narrative long con. Then, once you're in Neverwinter, you get a major branching choice. It's binary, you can either help the City Watch or Moira's Thieves control the Docks District, but you can only choose one, and it affects the rest of the game in minor ways. That kind of reactivity was largely absent from any of the Neverwinter Nights 1 campaigns. And at the end of the act, you'll journey northward through a small town called Ember and arrive at a stronghold of Githyanki after a silver sword. A piece of the sword is embedded in your chest. It is a crazy escalation, from rural calm, to swampy adventure, to mercenary hijinks, to extra planar creatures giving cryptic revelations. It all happens slowly enough to feel, if not exactly reasonable, plausible enough for D&D. Like the jousting in Wyvern Crown, the pacing here is certainly self-indulgent, but by the same coin, there's something to be said for being open to what it was that made them want to indulge in the first place. Neverwinter Nights 1 might have been more about multiplayer connectivity and the tool set than about storytelling, but Neverwinter Nights 2 is very much Obsidian's chance to explore what they love about Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. It's enthusiasm, it's affection for the high fantasy format and the sights and sounds of the Sword Coast carried me as much as the plot did, maybe farther. So the game will pull a move, like making you spend hours preparing to give testimony at a trial, and then spending the better part of 20 minutes inside the courtroom itself. Is this a diversion from the main events? Or is the multitude of threaded diversions more or less the whole point of the experience? The trial sequence is a great example, because you can completely zone out, skip everything, and still win in a trial by combat. A trial by combat that gets invoked even if you do prepare for and prevail in the courtroom portion. The entire first portion of the second act is, essentially, optional. The assumption, though, is that you'll take the potential death penalty seriously and investigate the butchering of the town of Ember yourself. Eyewitnesses say it was you who did it, but there is obviously magic at work. There are only a few areas to search, but if you're very thorough, you'll find many pieces of exonerating evidence and even discover surprise witnesses to take to the stand. With a testimony of magical creatures and some fancy lawyering provided by Sand, a sarcastic elf wizard you met when you first arrived in Neverwinter, the trial can commence. It's one of those moments where the fun of it is in the distance traveled. Sand is an old pal by now, and things have developed in wild directions since you first arrived in the city, boots muddied from the lizardfold caverns. The trial itself is absolutely absurd in how it allows you to present every single piece of evidence you found, and how each witness actually gets to be cross-examined by each side. Sand can ask questions and give responses to Torio, and then you have your own go with a whole different set of questions and answers, and then Torio gets her own turn with a set of questions and answers. This sequence is, by far, the longest and most complicated trial ever put into one of these games, and you can see why. It's only truly fun if you've done all the digging around to prepare for, and also if you have high bluff and diplomacy skills. 
If not, you get hammered by Torio's cable TV quality twistings of the truth. But if you do happen to play that way, holy shit is it ever a treat. Catching Torio in lies or swinging the opinion of jurors back around after a lengthy speech, it's all so complicated, so delightful, and so fundamentally unnecessary. The whole thing seems geared towards assuming you won't be too completionist about it, and if you lose and are sentenced to death, well, there's always the murder contest. If Torio loses, even if she loses by a unanimous vote in your favor, she will always invoke the trial by combat. You fight here Lorne, the bully from West Harbor that they talked about at the Harvest Fair a million years ago. So it's a moment that the developer wants to happen regardless, this showdown between the West Harbor outcasts. The only thing you get to take with you from the trial is a reputation marker on your character sheet, a small official acknowledgement that your character once lawyered their ass off. And then the plot proceeds the same as it would have if you hit the escape key over and over again while chugging a beer. Is it bad design because it doesn't force you to bother with its high, highest effort achievements and thus condemns them to potential irrelevance? Or is it good design because no player is penalized for disinterest during the course of a gigantic 80-hour campaign? One of the things I enjoyed about Baldur's Gate 2 was its willingness to let things slip past the player. There's an entire undersea city with multiple side quests and great characters that you can miss if you take a more obvious route along the main plot path. Neverwinter Nights 2 follows in those footsteps by putting tremendous attention to detail into things that are, arguably, as frivolous as a realistic jousting simulation. Yet, this isn't like in Neverwinter Nights 1, where it had D&D stuff like Dungeons and Quests just out of vague obligation to have those things. Here, all of those things are grounded in lore and character, and the assumption that if you're given a good reason to feel curious, you'll see where that curiosity will take you. The most successful and memorable unnecessary thing in the game is definitely Crossroad Keep, the character's stronghold. Player strongholds are something that pop up every now and then in fantasy RPGs, and fascination with them largely started with the Darnese Keep quests of Baldur's Gate 2. While different classes had different strongholds in that game, like a theater for the bard or a temple for the paladin, warrior types got a whole damn castle with quests about how to run it to themselves, what kind of ruler the player wanted to be, that kind of thing. It's an extra step of power tripping, not just how you'd be as a character with great personal power, but one with meaningful political power as well. While it was used as a starting point for other quests and not a mini-management sim, Darkness Over Daggerford also had a player stronghold, and Alan Miranda directly cites the Darnese Keep quests as inspiration for it. After Neverwinter Nights 2, you'd get stronghold management elements in Dragon Age Awakening, and also Dragon Age Inquisition, although the management elements would become more streamlined during the Dragon Age iterations. Crossroad Keep is the most complicated, finicky, and fundamentally pointless out of all of these strongholds. It's also the most compelling. The tricky thing about it is how it's timed. Each occasion you enter and exit the main room of the keep, the time elapsed percentage bar inches closer to 100%, so you need to always be purposeful in doing something with the system each time you visit the keep interior, or it just flows right past you. The exception to this is when it pauses for you to complete story content, like moving from Act 2 to Act 3. To upgrade your soldiers' armor and weapons to the highest level, you need to find every resource node in every act, so you have to have been mindful of this minigame since the extreme beginning of Neverwinter Nights 2. To achieve the highest level of competency and discipline among, among your troops, you need to counterintuitively refuse most new recruits, only accept the best. Bevel, your old West Harbor friend, will come on to lead special quests into the surrounding areas, which provide loot. There's a lot, but I only triggered a scant handful in my, in my given percentage. Another sergeant, who you meet in the Orcish campaigns of Act 1, trains your troops. A third, a strange woman who you meet in Act 3, can slightly boost the number of extremely good soldiers you recruit. A steady, consistent rotation of troops between patrolling the, ro the roads and patrolling the woods is required to keep the trade routes safe. You can spend huge gobs of money upgrading the roads with pavement and guard towers, upgrading the keep. You never see most of these changes. You just pay the money and people tell you about them. Like the trial, the game is designed to function just fine if you ignore pretty much all of this and never bother with it. You might miss a couple side quests by not building structures, and you might make the battle where the King of Shadows attacks the keep at the end of Act 3 a little more difficult, but only just a little. There is a huge amount of effort you can put into this system, and the rewards are almost solely imaginative. You can see it in your mind, the skirmishes of your well-trained men against the bandits, see the roads looking clean and clear and pristine but not on the screen. On the one hand, what's the point then? But on the other hand, isn't imaginative projection pretty much the name of the game when it comes to Dungeons & Dragons? The Stronghold system and its quests are more content, where they're only as engaging as a player's willingness to engage with them. 
Crossroad Keep is a big experiment in giving the player a noble's responsibilities, and it mostly doesn't work that well. It's fine to ignore it. But like the trial, you'll be skipping parts of the game where it actually gives itself a memorable self-identity. By the time you get to the third act, the game is still adding complications and characters and doing very little to wrap things up. Every layer of villains so far, the Githyanki, Amanjero, Blagarius, they were all just a prelude to the return of the King of Shadows. The third act is primarily a lore dump, where after having finally exhausted every other possible MacGuffin, you actually do get a clear picture of what's going on. This is a lot of what people feel is the game's major narrative imbalance. There are huge portions of Neverwinter Nights 2 that function as prelude or digression, and when you've already put 50 hours into the thing, only then does it yield and finally get to the heart of the matter. This is unusual pacing for video games, but not really uncommon pacing for Forgotten Realms novels. Long series take big diversions to build up the ensemble dynamic. They have villains specific to one book and absent the larger arc. They do a lot of world building right at the end because the last book of the series is still an independent book and needs its own narrative arc. Echoing that pacing is another example of the main game being, at its root, much more celebratory of the Forgotten Realms than critical or experimental. The whole long arc of story is designed to methodically move through the archetypal phases of an adventurer's career, from low-level unknown upstart, to the mid-level mercenary making waves, to the revered and respected hero leading the charge to save the kingdom. The third act may feel a little more linear than previous acts, as you move from exposition to revelation to confrontation in short order, but you still do a hugely diverse array of adventurous things, like going to visit the ghost of an ancient and evil dragon, the only being old enough to remember the King of Shadows when he was still mortal. Armed with that knowledge, you can visit the ancient Ilfarn ruins where his monstrous form was created, meet the spirit of a librarian who gives you another massive lore dump, and then solve a disgustingly irritating puzzle where you try to corral four ghosts into a single area, like some kind of elven spirit rodeo. It's packed with stuff. It's an understood of game design that higher levels take longer to get to than lower levels, but in Dungeons & Dragons that's always been an excuse to draw out the amount of time that a player is in various stages of competency and fame. A long, huge adventure where you only gain a level or so controls for a consistency of play in the individual adventure. A lot of pen and paper modules are made that way, only for characters 4 to 8, only for characters 10 to 12, only for epic level characters, etc. The first Neverwinter Nights used 3rd edition, but Neverwinter Nights 2 uses 3.5. If you don't know 3rd edition, maybe that sounds like a minor change, but the 3rd and a half edition adds a whole lot of customizability, like a new emphasis on prestige classes, and a whole lot more consistency in challenge, meaning combat feels sharper and quicker. There's less time spent swinging and missing. 3rd and a half's changes are most apparent at high levels, so when you finally reach the top of the power curve, you're powerful in more interesting and useful ways than you might have found yourself before. Myself, I aimed for a prestige class called the Eldritch Knight, a uh, warrior wizard. I'll be honest, it is a terrible build, but while it was aggravating and underpowered in the first ten levels, as I got deeper into the prestige levels, my character finally felt useful in both, both its roles as a wizard and a fighter. And it wasn't just a few short hours at the climax I had to play that way, either. I had the entire back third of the game, a hard-won power plateau I'd struggled to reach all adventure long so far. So, if you're expecting tight writing, the third act is admittedly a scatterbrain kind of thing, but if you're looking to savor the Dungeons & Dragons experience at the exhaustively slow pace it does mechanically encourage, the third act hits the mark dead center. One of the most annoying things about the end of Mass Effect 3 was how it marooned your companions on some planet somewhere and refused to elaborate on their future fate. Mass Effect 3 was infamous for how much frustration and bad noise among fans the underwhelming low-effort epilogue generated. Neverwinter Nights 2 pulled the same stunt, and it's barely remembered, positively or negatively. When you finally get to the suitably creepy boss chamber, a lot of last-minute drama erupts. Nishka either stays loyal or defects, and then Quara either stays loyal or defects in the final room. And then, once the last die is cast and the big scary dude falls, the temple collapses and no one knows what happens to you or your companions. The only ones who do get epilogue slides are the ones who left your party further back. For me, that was Eleni. She's supposed to be the male player character's love interest, and so she's written to be irrationally jealous of Nishka if you're supportive of her. Eleni picks fights and forces you to choose sides, resulting in large reputation losses with whoever you snub. It's really frustrating. There is no reason why they shouldn't get along, but the writers evidently felt that having multiple women in the party was intolerable if they didn't act stereotypically catty to one another, for whatever reason. 
As a result, Eleni refused to stay with the party when the chance came to reunite with the remnants of her druid circle. It was a good ending for her, but I often felt like Eleni's independent character got lost inside of her intended role in the story as a romantic partner. Of course, if she had stayed, she'd just be mysteriously entombed with the rest of the sporting cast, so good for her, I guess. The epilogue is generally pretty good at being reacted to the largest choices you made in the game, although it fails to recognize smaller, more emotionally weighted choices on the level that Fallout New Vegas did. So, how did Never Winter Nights 2 get away with the same variety of underwhelming cliffhanger that Mass Effect 3 had? Mostly because its broader cast failed to resonate with a lot of people, and so a lack of a nod on their end of the story threads had little consequence or weight. I liked most of the characters, and even then, I find it hard to care that much that they didn't get epilogues. I liked them well enough for the journey we had, and we all defeated the bad guy, so I, I guess that's the end of the story. This is the negative consequence of being so formulaic. You already know the ending. You already knew the ending from a long way back. You knew at the minute they said King of Shadows, you thought to yourself, oh, he sounds unpleasant, and from that moment you knew you'd eventually defeat him, and all the NPCs would say, yay, you did it, and you'd say to yourself, yay, I did it, and that's it, that's game over, man. In a tabletop group, a victory like that is two things. It's a narrative experience and a social experience. The campaign, on top of being a campaign, is a shared memory of many nights of fun and friendship. But with a digital role-playing game, you're left sitting in your chair with a tiny goofy flag that says, Hooray for me in the sound of distant traffic. All your companions never had a future after the game ended anyway. I mean, the game just ends. Neverwinter Nights 2 plays it so safe that you never really forget that you're playing a game. And so, even if it's a fun game and an enjoyable one, it never suspends its disbelief high enough to make a racket when it comes crashing down. Neverwinter Nights 2 is a good drag Dungeons & Dragons adventure. It has heart, it has spirit, it has a great understanding of what makes Dungeons & Dragons such an enduringly unique way to experience high fantasy storytelling. There's dozens of wonderful stories that you could say the same thing about. But that doesn't really stop them from lining the shelves of the sci-fi fantasy section at Goodwill, sitting next to a 99 cent copy of How Elminster Got His Groove Back. This dedication to a Forgotten Realms traditionalism in the main campaign is what makes the unbound, relentless creativity of the first expansion pack so surprising. This expansion is Mask of the Betrayer, one of the most obscure of the truly great Western RPG stories of the 3D era. From the first conversation, the writing style is much more genuinely novelistic than the main game, giving the player far more interesting and varied dialogue, often with major branches of dialogue accessible only through skill or class or tribute checks. It isn't just having more intricate conversations that makes the writing truly phenomenal, though. It's the willingness to engage with symbolism and themes more personal and melancholy than the usual range of expression in a D&D adventure. Mask is often compared to Planescape Torment in theme and content, and while the comparison is sound, what makes Mask of the Betrayer stand out even from intentional follow-ups like Torment Tides of Numenera is the fact that it isn't trying to reuse details of world-building and approaches to storytelling that feel imitative. Instead, both Mask of the Betrayer and Planescape Torment use the mythological framework of the D&D cosmos to spin physical journeys out of emotional ones. They both preference solving quests through curiosity and subterfuge over combat and scavenger hunts. And, most critically, they both have a lot of sympathy for the existential smallness of individual people in a universe, quite literally, of gods and monsters. So, why is Mask of the Betrayer so often overlooked when it comes to discussions about the legacy of Planescape and RPG design? Well, two main reasons. The first and most obvious is that an expansion pack to a middlingly popular, mechanically routine D&D sequel, released in the same year The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion was changing the way everyone looked at RPG design, was a release kind of doomed to obscurity from the get-go. But maybe doomed isn't the right word when it comes to Mask of the Betrayer. A developer blog by George Zietz, published long after the game was released, explained that if it wasn't for low publisher expectations for an obscure fringe product, Mask of the Betrayer might not have been half as good. Zietz writes, quote, when NX1, Neverwinter Expansion 1, was first described to me, it was pitched as a simple hack-and-slash adventure. Neverwinter Nights 2 was expected to do reasonably well, and the expansion would be a quick, relatively low-cost way to provide a follow-up product to fans. Expansions never sell as well as the original product, so their budgets are proportionally reduced. I was not particularly excited about making a hack-and-slasher, so I pushed back on that particular point. 
To the, credit of our, to the credit of our lead, Kevin Saunders, he allowed me to pursue a much more expansive vision that required more work and longer hours. Also, because Mask was expected to be a simple hack-and-slasher, the publisher paid little attention to what we were doing. Effectively, we operated under most people's radar. This was great because we were able to pursue a vision that was shared among the team and didn't suffer from interference from outside. As in any in industry, outside interference is a reality of game development. Sometimes it works out fine, as when higher-ups are heavily invested in a franchise, understand the core vision, and give well-informed feedback that improves the product. But the more a publisher or executive is separated from the project, the more likely they'll give a direction that doesn't strengthen the game." End quote. Mask of the Betrayer, like Darkness over Daggerford, is an example of an official D&D campaign almost entirely without corporate oversight, but much larger and more intense than Daggerford by far. It feels just as amazing as that sounds. The second reason for its obscurity in the larger conversation about RPG design is that the game does depend on having already experienced the Neverwinter Nights 2 main campaign and built up a character in its world. Mask of the Betrayer is an epic level campaign like Hordes of the Underdark, but in each area where Hordes of the Underdark was campy and excessive, Mask of the Betrayer is moody and introspective. It picks up with your main character from the main campaign waking up in a deep underground barrow, surrounded by runes meant to contain a great evil. The shard of the Gith's silver sword that was lodged inside your character's chest is gone, ripped out and raggedly sewn back up. In its place is the evil that these runes were meant to contain, the curse of the Spirit Eater. It's like having a symbiotic relationship with a black hole. It eats, and it eats, and it eats, and the more it eats, the more it hungers. In the meantime, it gives the player fantastic powers to acquire its food and rip the souls right out of living creatures. When the hunger eventually becomes too great, the curse is passed on to another. It's been a presence in local folklore for hundreds on hundreds of years, and it's always both tragic and fatal, and now it's your turn. It's a great way to deepen the connection between the world and player during the absurdities of epic level play. If you're willing to feed the beast, it'll turn you into a kind of dark demigod, giving you access to power completely beyond what's appropriate or balanced for your class. If min-maxing and playing for mechanical dominance is your jam, this doubles down on the power-leveling thrill of the epic levels. If you're playing mostly for plot, then the slow starvation of the Spirit Eater will damage your character and create extra challenges to temper the feeling of being too powerful. It makes you fragile in a way that the regular rules don't allow for at that level. Finding ways to suppress the hunger and try to dodge the bullet of your new destiny pays off in fantastic ways once the game really gets going. So there's payoffs either way you choose to play it, and they both roughly align with the two major playstyles for an RPG like Neverwinter Nights. The system is sometimes frustrating because the bar ticks lower and lower as time goes on no matter what you do, and as you feed the hunger, that bar will go down faster. In a given area, there's only a few suitable souls to consume. So there's a pressure there that's unfamiliar to the generally leisurely pace of adventuring in previous Neverwinter Nights content. But I didn't feel like it was an unwelcome pressure at all. It lends a sense of finite mortality to the level range where all of that usually starts to fade away. More than that, though, is that it inverts the special destiny plot that stands as a cliché in so many role-playing games. The shard that made you special is gone, tossed aside like garbage. The destiny you have now is more special, more magical by far. And it's not only creepy, but it's painfully terminal. So, right away, the expansion's doing subversions of tropes that the main campaign was extremely happy doing straight. The earnestness of the base game was a key part of its personality, but this is the kind of creative risk that sets Mask of the Betrayer apart. And it was risky. A lot of critics at the time were very unfavorable towards the Spirit Eater system. But if that system was simply part of the dialogue and there was no actual risk to your character in a mechanical way, it would be a theme, and not a curse. As it is, you aren't allowed to forget it's there. Its hunger is gnawing and constant, and while this does provoke an anxious mood that wasn't there in the base game, an anxious mood is exactly what the whole expansion is aiming to create on every level. It takes place in Rashomon, a land ruled by witches and their berserker protectors, where Minsk, Boo, and Dynakir came from prior to the events of Baldur's Gate 1. Instead of the dungeon-focused Underdark, Rashomon is a wild land of spirits and mysteries. The barrow you wake up in serves as an introductory dungeon to it all, which is kind of a weird inclusion for an epic-level expansion. There's really not much tutorializing that needs to be done at that point. It matters more as a way to draw out the transition between Rashomon and the Sword Coast, starting with caves and dungeons that feel comfortable and familiar, before putting you on the bad side of a bear god named Aku. Aku is 
no question, one of the most goddamn majestic bears in the history of video games. It's a character designed like it was described in a campfire retelling of some old tall tale about the great bear spirit with the sunset in his fur. Aku is a great way to set the tone for what is unique about Rashomon from the Sword Coast region, more exotic and colorful, and legend and landscape both. And Aku is determined to hunt you down and gut you. Although you, de although you defeat him in the intro dungeon, you soon find yourself on the bad side of the city of Mulsantir when Aku returns with an army of spirits to lay siege to the place until they cough you up for him. At this point, you have your first real test of how far you want your spirit-eating powers to go. Once you've found a party and gone out to face Aku, you can either take that big old ancient soul of his and shred it into nothingness, absorbing his essence to grow your own power, or you can deny your hunger, and in doing so, slow the rate of its consumption of your own soul. If you spare him, he honors your control over the curse by offering to come with you, looking for a cure. Aku is one of only a very small cast of companions, but the game has enough variables and enough true player choice that you can consume his soul, remove him from play, and progress the story perfectly well. If you do have him come along, he even has his own unique backstory quest, confronting the ghosts of his ancestors who are driven mad by the Spirit Eater's imprisonment in the Barrow. Aku has always, always fought the Spirit Eater, but it was him who conspired with another poor mortal who had the curse to trap the thing down there in the barrow. It was Aku who soured his people's own holy ground. For better or worse, you can only resolve the life's work of this noble godlike beast by either freeing yourself and dissolving the curse, or else succumbing to it and proving Aku doubly the fool for having trusted the words of a mortal. The main plot is woven around the deep backstories of the characters like ivy around a column, so that no character feels like an archetype or an idea. They're all completely grounded in the events and places of the game, inseparable from the story being told. Kelgar, Nishka, Eleni, all solid characters, but they could fit into most any Forgotten Realm story and still make perfect sense. Where else but Mask of the Betrayer would a fallen celestial, a red wizard of Thay, a hagspawn, a bear god, and a terrifying wrathful ghost functionally work as an ensemble supporting cast? On the surface, maybe that sounds like more novelty fluff like the adventuring party in the Kingmaker Premium Module. If Mask of the Betrayer was less detailed, maybe it would be, but each character in this expansion means something, something tied to the journey of the player, and something tied to the overarching themes of the plot. In this way, Mask of the Betrayer successfully imitates a lot of the overall feel of Planescape Torment. There's hardly any scrap dialogue, hardly any throwaway quests, hardly any characters that don't in some way contribute to the overall direction and mood. The main campaign of Neverwinter Nights 2 was all about those sort of digressions, diversion after delightful diversion. This is much tighter in every way, smaller of scale and physical space, more focused in its themes and dialogue, more purposeful with its dungeons. Like the central curse, characters talk about it like an illness and like a monster, and it is both. It was once a person, anyway. Akachi, a mortal who once used the same silver sword whose fragments ended up in your chest to attack the realm of the god of death himself. He did it for love, but the legacy of his devotion is the pain and death the curse has spent centuries causing. All of that comes to a head in fascinating ways, resolving Akachi's crusade and his unfinished business, while simultaneously seeking your own salvation and mounting a crusade on Kelimvor's throne yourself. Like Planescape Torment, the mythological elements work in harmony and sympathy with the personal emotional stories of the characters. Getting the frame right is important, which is why the lore has to come first. Once you've made it to the city of Mulsantir, you eventually need to find a sealed vault that the God of the Dead kept, except not the current God of the Dead, Kelimvor. Kelimvor is harsh, but fair, a respectable god. Before him was Mikkel, a cruel and vengeful god who took true delight in the judgment and punishment of mortal souls. Now, Dungeons and Dragons takes place in a universe where things like gods and goddesses and heavens and hells and different flavored purgatories all demonstrably exist. You die and are judged and then go to an eternal reward that suits you. You can literally summon the spirits of the dead and they'll tell you flat out that that's the way that it goes. There's no excuse, really, to not believe and not have faith in something, since there is a deity for not just all the points of the moral compass, but all sorts of different enthusiasms and beliefs even within a compass point. And, more importantly, they do answer when you pray to them. To not believe, to not care, is something Mikkel took great offense to. So, he built the Wall of the Faithless. 
Any soul who rejects divinity in all forms is entombed in the wall, and it slowly, painfully devours their memories and essence until they no longer exist in any way. It's a wildly harsh punishment. It is unfair and spiteful and just plain evil. That's Meikle for you, though. In his judgment of souls, he's apt to have you drawn and quartered for a parking ticket. So, Akachi was one of his high priests, and the woman he loved would have wound up in the wall. So, he ground against the gears of the Great Wheel itself and tried to tear down the wall. He failed. He became the curse of the Spirit Eater. He would do compulsively to the innocent exactly what the wall he fought against does. Each spirit consumed would glorify Mikul, revere his sadistic legacy, even as the old god's bones float quietly on the winds of the astral plane. A little bit of an improvement over Black Garius and the Lord of Shadows, isn't it? Akachi is known as the Betrayer, and so the title of the expansion is referring to you, the player. What are you? Are you the mask of flesh hiding the Spirit Eater's hunger? Like how all the companion characters in Planescape Torment associate with the Nameless One on the basis of that emotion, the torment of a conflicted nature, masks are the central connective metaphor of the cast here too. Gon is the most obvious of them, a hag-spawn spirit shaman whose specialty is walking in the dreams of others. Hags are known for being generally murderous and awful, but they covet and sometimes they love, and the children of these unions are renowned for being both beautiful and intensely broken. Gone of Dreams is something of a cliché, as the handsome and flirtatious bad boy sort, kind of like Geralt in the Witcher games, but more vain. However, the way he balances his everyday narcissism with an interest in grand heroic gestures and being seen heroically does feel human and real. After a while, selflessness starts feeling a little more natural to Gon than reflexive self-interest. It's a small character arc, but it's a smaller game, and anything more dramatic wouldn't feel as convincing and real. Gon is mostly a shit when you meet him, and eventually, he's less of a shit when he realizes he can have actual friendships if he gets his head out of his ass every now and then. That's a relatable character arc. Plus, later you meet his mother. The thing was, Gon's mother actually did love his father. Among the society of hags, such weakness is a crime. They chopped up Gon's dad, they fed it to her, Gon's mom, and then she went mad with grief. All his life, Gon was shown that sincerity and connection make you vulnerable. Love kills. So he puts on a mask of a man who doesn't care, who's lovable in a way where he never loves back, a privately depressed drifter Lothario. More exotic of an arc is that of Kaelin the Dove, a celestial who has become more and more jaded and disappointed by the moral state of the cosmos the more she sees of it. This is not to say she's visibly angry. On the contrary, she is utterly serene and unfailingly kind to the player. She was one of Kelimvor's doom guides, a priestess type, who helps the living prepare for the cosmological sorting hat of death. But when she learned of the Wall of the Faithless, when she saw how petty the gods were towards innocent souls who simply led spiritually introverted or disconnected lives, she resolved to do something about it, even if it means crossing Kelimvor. Her journey echoes Akachi's, and so, naturally, she's drawn to your cause. You're both making your way to the same destination. The mask she wears is her celestial nature, her smile set in unchanging marble. She's a creature of obvious divinity, yet she cares more for mortals than she ever did for the spinning of the planes, willing to forsake her heritage, her religion, and her future in her crusade against the wall. She's driven by rage, sadness, raw defiance. You've got to get to know her pretty well before the ferocity of her feelings becomes clear. And should you find yourself at cross-purposes down the line, that ferocity will be solely directed at you. Mask of the Betrayer's mid-game takes place out in the wilds of Rashomon, and in the shadow side of Molson Tear, where the Black Gate Akachi walks through to assault the City of Judgment still stands. It's all pretty freeform, as open as anything in the main campaign, but more dense in content for the maps that you do explore. You do things like adventure through an ancient forest whose spirit has stopped talking to the druids. When you've thoroughly explored the forest, brought either harmony or chaos to the full of it, you'll meet the Woodman. He's the voice and essence of the entire forest. In the lower levels of Dungeons & Dragons, mythology is something that gives context to what you do, hearing stories, learning clues, raiding old tombs and temples. In the epic levels, you participate directly in the making of new myths, speaking as equals with incredible and wondrous creatures who would have seemed all-powerful back in your rat-smashing days. And still, a diversity of choice for the player. You can consume the forest's essence and have a big old pine-fresh belch afterwards, or you can heal the spirit, use your own dwindling essence and force it out of your own soul into the forests to heal it. If you do it once, you can do it again. You learn this new skill where you can use a portion of your hunger bar to heal companions. 
The Woodman will tell you about how this is not his first time meeting the Spirit Eater, either. The curse is a cycle. It wears new masks, but the hunger is always the same. Until now, if you help him, anyway. There's a beautiful narrative satisfaction in breaking these ancient cycles and fixing things that have been long broken, but the game doesn't force you into that role. You can just as easily eat the Woodman, his defeat bringing glory to the player, glory to Mikul. This kind of quest, threaded so tightly into the overarching themes and plot direction, are all over the quest, one after another. There's barely anything in the game that doesn't mean something in some way, in the context of what's being explored in a general kind of sense. The only area that's bloated and out of balance is a late-game visit to the Thane Academy. It's about three straight hours of puzzles, some good, some profoundly irritating, like having to balance two rooms of fire and ice methods with only a single lever-operated trapdoor to do it with. There's some side content, too, most notably a quest where you bargain with demons for the souls of Ammon Jero, the villain turned companion from the main campaign. Jero tells you what he remembers of your companions, who lived, who died. A creature of shadow earlier in the game gave you some idea of the same, since it was that creature that plucked you from the climax of the main campaign and brought you into the new story. Jero, though, is pleasantly credible, and one of the only familiar faces you'll see in the entire expansion. He joins you for this portion of the game, and, assuming he lives through it, joins you again in Kelimvor's City of Judgment. But he doesn't get the Aku treatment. They didn't seem to be able to get the voice actor to come back for Jero, and he has only a few brief lines of dialogue. It's alright. Even though Ammon Jero was the most conflicted of the main campaign's companions, he just doesn't hold a candle to the new ones. Sophia is the first character you meet, but the last one to have her backstory fully processed, making her a bit of a friendly enigma for much of the game. Where Gon can have a romantic subplot with a female player character, Sophia has a romantic subplot with a male player character, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Sophia is a little unique among RPG romances, though, in that her subplot is explicitly an echo of long-ago things you discover about the main plot. Akachi's lost love is still, magically, alive. She founded the Thayan Academy, in fact, and not only Sophia, but her mother and her sisters that he met earlier are all facets of that same old soul, broken off and given purpose. That whole puzzle sequence? That was all about experiments to move souls, fragment souls, fuse souls together. It was foreshadowing with puzzles. And as much of a slowdown in the game's pacing as the Thayan Academy is, it does make the revelations about Sophia and the Founder feel convincing when they come. So, the chemistry between the player's character and Sophia, is that sincere? Or is it an echo of Akachi reaching out to an echo of someone who seems critically familiar to him? The issue of masks for Sophia isn't so straightforward as it is for Gon. For her, the question is how much of her being is actually independent, how much is free will, and how much is reading from a script written for her long in advance. In reclaiming independence from the curse, in reclaiming your identity and agency, Sophia can do the same with the strange circumstances of her own existence. Sophia would have made a stronger impression as a character had she been developed earlier, but she holds up a significant amount of the game's larger plot the way they did do it. For the revelation to work and have meaning, you have to lay down a huge amount of exposition about how the lore works first, and then you have to have a casual, friendly understanding of Sophia as a well-meaning person, who she is on the day-to-day -day stuff, and then you need to tie all that together with a big climactic reveal. A reveal that works even better if you throw in an entirely optional, easily missable, romantic subplot. It's bold and risky storytelling, not risky because it's transgressing any boundaries, but risky because it's a very weird house of narrative cards that's either going to turn out to be an extremely impressive and intricate accomplishment, or a messy pile of flattened possibilities. Where Neverwinter Nights 2 is as familiar and comforting as Snow on Christmas, Mask of the Betrayer weaves its characters into the plot in unexpected, genuinely surprising ways. The plot itself goes into unexpected, philosophically dramatic territory. The main campaign was about the most earnest root value of Dungeons & Dragons. Friendship matters. The party is the foundation of all fun and adventure. Mask of the Betrayer, instead, asks, If the structure of the universe is unfair, and even the gods know it, is it not then now your burden to right that moral imbalance yourself? What is the higher virtue, to abide the laws of the gods, or to have compassion for mortals, to exercise your will and serve your own interests? Mask of the Betrayer offers so many dialogue options, so many scenarios that branch in unpredictable ways, that you're not just offered a chance to answer those questions, it's impossible to navigate the plot at all without forming some kind of concrete, moral, philosophical perspective and opinion on the matter. It's Bishop from the original campaign who ends up clarifying the stakes of the expansion. 
Bishop was dislikable, sure, but he was only human. He was selfish, cutthroat, and chances are good that you killed the shit out of him at the end of your original journey together. But does he deserve the slow annihilation of his entire being? There are three strange dreams in the game before it all comes to a head. In one you see a boy, in another the red woman, the soul who made the, the mold for Sophia's. In the third dream you appear yourself before the wall of the faithless, long before your climactic confrontation with it. Bishop is being absorbed into the wall, but recognizes you enough to lob some insults your way. He's putting on a brave face. Like with Erebeth in Hordes of the Underdark, this expansion humanizes a character I'd, find, I'd found shallow in the main campaign. Bishop's fear is real. The smallness of his person in the grand scheme of things is clear, and yet he's still got this brutal fate ahead of him no matter what. Sure, it felt just that he died the first time around, and you always knew he gave no shits for anything spiritual, but this, this is like discovering the guy who overcharged you for weed in high school was sentenced to death by giant snake, swallowed and dissolved slowly in some bizarre ages-old ritual. It's too much, man. Bishop hands you a final fragment of a mask to match those from previous dreams. Each is a memory, the final, undissolved memories of Akachi the Betrayer, his family, his love, and his knowledge of the wall's injustice. All that's needed to heal the sucking wound of the Spirit Eater curse. The most satisfying ending in the game, where the curse is healed and Akachi goes on to the afterlife he had been denied, is only possible with these mask fragments. Without memory, without context, all he is is hunger. With the restoration of self-knowledge comes restoration of the self. For you too, of course. When you reach the City of Judgment, it can go down a couple of ways. The most obvious, the most exciting option is to continue Akachi's crusade, in which case you order around Akachi's old lieutenants to lay siege to three districts in any order you choose. Alternately, you can respect Kelmvor's authority as, you know, a god, and defend his city against the crusade in return for his favor in undoing the curse. If you do this, Kaelin the Dove will turn on you, her conviction deeper than her loyalty to you personally. Even at this late stage, small actions matter. One of Akachi's lieutenants is a demi-lich named Ranak, just evil to the core and extremely powerful. It's convenient to just go along with Ranak and accept his help, but if you do, in the epilogue, he'll kill Kaelin in a moment of petty betrayal. And then, you reach the wall of the Faithless at last. In the end, you only tear away one soul, your own. But Kelimvor allows it to happen. He wishes you well, provided your actions show that you meant well. Kaelin says that what you've done is a symbolic victory more than anything, but these are the planes. Belief is reality. The wall of the faithless is not unyielding, and in knowing it can be torn down. Even a brick. The mortar of the whole thing begins to weaken. The, el the epilogue slides here are fantastic, with detailed explanations of what happens to everyone. Like Kaelin continuing your crusade without you and having even more success, making her kind of a saint to the faithless. Unless, of course, you casually bargain with Ranak, in which case she dies. The player even loops themselves. They return to West Harbor and Crossroad Keep, and if you've been pursuing a romance, the pair of you get married there. The game won't say if you stay in West Harbor, that's between the player and the modules they download, but the looping here serves a larger purpose. From the very beginning, your character has carried a burden. First it was the shard, the weight of special destiny, that drove you from the town with the blood of your friend still wet on your clothes. Then it was the curse, the negative destiny, that you successfully appealed as far up the chain of command as cosmologically possible. Now, for the first time since that sunny afternoon a million years ago when you solved the case of the two large hog and won the Harvest Cup, your character is free. Obsidian's second expansion for Neverwinter Nights 2 went in a wildly different direction, and I don't blame it a bit for doing so. Mask of the Betrayer is a difficult act to follow, so they follow it with an act that doesn't even compete to do the same things with it. If Neverwinter Nights 2's main campaign was a kind of stock standard dialogue-driven RPG and Mask of the Betrayer was its contemplative moody follow-up, then Storm of Zahir would tell a deliberately colorful, light-hearted story of pure pulp adventure. It modeled itself much more on Icewind Dale than Neverwinter Nights, and even echoes older AD&D computer games from the Gold Box era. Storm of Zahir, like the later premium modules of the first Neverwinter Nights, knows that at the tail end of a product's shelf life, it's novelty that makes new content eye-catching. Storm of Zahir may well be the strangest game in Obsidian's catalog, in all the good and bad ways you might expect such a game to turn out. It's excessively ambitious, heavily stylized, and defiantly quaint in a way that feels unusual for Obsidian. 
I love it for all of that. It's always fun to see studios make major deviations from their tropes, and so Obsidian putting out a Dungeons & Dragons adventure that's light on plot and even lighter on dialogue is a hell of a curiosity even just on the surface of things. In the details of the thing, Storm of Zahir is like the Crossroad Keep Stronghold minigame expanded to more and more aspects of design, oddly complex systems implemented in largely optional and awkwardly fussy ways. It feels much less predictable and straightforward than the main campaign, but the experimentation being done is implementing an even more traditional D&D approach than the main campaign did. Storm of Zahir, in a lot of critical ways, takes up the banner of the first Neverwinter Nights in its attempt to translate the dice rolling, skill checking game of Dungeons & Dragons more than the imaginative experience of collaborative storytelling. The most important and obvious element of that is full party customization. This is freeing, in a way, because instead of choosing from a small pool of pre-written companions, you can get waist-deep in the rulebook and make a custom-balanced party mechanically tailored to your individual play style. You can play around with races and classes you'd never choose for a full-game protagonist because you have so many slots to fill. If a character dies, you can roll a new one to replace them. There is little penalty to being playful in how you construct your characters. Even more critically, the dialogue window has been retooled so that you can use any party member to speak at any time, and they'll use their own skills to unlock unique dialogue. So you don't have to have one character, your main character, with diplomacy, bluff, and intimidate. You can have three characters with one skill each and then a fourth with taunt on top of it. All four of those characters might get a unique dialogue choice, and all four of those choices would be available to use during the same line. The trade-off is that all four of those choices will probably arrive at the same outcome. The system is utilitarian, and the writing often is as well. What's being rewarded is not the player's creative choices, but the player's mechanical choices. These skills are meant to open up new paths the same as a rogue can, can pick locks, and the skills often allow you to skip steps of a quest or skip fights, but you won't really use the social skills in the context of character-based role-playing. Like other modules and expansions, the design differences between Storm of Zahir and Obsidian's other campaigns are roughly equivalent to stylistic differences between tabletop play groups. Not every group is going to be so into narrative as electronic campaigns usually are. Some people don't like the improv aspect, some people are shy, some people just preference the combat numerical progression. In average, everyday D&D group is likely going to have a party of characters who are two pages deep. The character sheet, the inventory on the back, and a page's scribbled backstory. In the original Baldur's Gate, this kind of functional companionship was a notable design difference even from Baldur's Gate 2. Scripted games, in general, can do more storytelling than tabletop games are often able to accomplish because they can have so many different voice actors, such carefully curated areas and quests, dialogue that's not only premeditated, but edited and arranged for clarity. It's not like the tabletop way, where if you're the dungeon master you have to speak for every single character, not the party. At some point, you just worry you're going to run out of voices. Tabletop play is often digressive. A party will frequently come up with quest solutions outside of what the dungeon master expected. They'll explore in directions not prepared for, both in terms of on the map and what they prioritize in their general course of action. Open world role-playing games in the electronic sphere capitalize on that impulsive, digressive rhythm of play. Conversely, the mostly linear Mask of the Betrayer portrayed and explored the theatrical side of Dungeons & Dragons in grander ways than the tabletop game could do, and its linearity was a design choice favorable to that theatricality. It controls better for pacing and for tone. Storm of Zahir, on the other hand, tries to bring that impulsive, explorative side of Dungeons & Dragons to life in a more exciting way than the tabletop game might be able to present. It is, in a rough way, an open-world expansion. The game is divided into two gigantic overworld maps which you traverse in real-time 3D. When you leave an individual location like a dungeon or a town, you choose one party member as leader and then use them to navigate the overworld. Random encounters appear, which is a fun novelty at first, but quickly becomes extremely tedious with a multitude of loading screens that Neverwinter Nights 2 throws at you every time you transition between maps. There are also neutral and positive random encounters, strange travelers, or beings like a blue dragon, maybe an evil druid and his pack of panthers, or even one of many, an evil companion from Mask of the Betrayer who makes a cameo here. If you have spot and move silently, you can sneak past most of the unwanted encounters. If you have search, you can find all sorts of caches of valuables and crafting items out on the overworld map. With the saturated colors and bright promise of classic, unrefined adventure, Storm of Zahir has a kind of casual feel to it that is hard to pin down. As much as scripted companions are meant to fill the void left by other players, this upbeat and whimsical tone is intended to mitigate what's lost when you lose that social fun of the tabletop experience, the collaborative thrill of deciding where to go next, and applying the skills of your character sheet to the world at large. That 
common memory of players and dungeon masters, of a Xeroxed map on the table and dice in the hand, is what Storm of Zahir is interested in replicating more than it's interested in telling a story, much more. The story is mostly there to frame and organize progression through the map. There's around a hundred locations in the game, and well over half of them are completely optional. The areas are also all short and to the point. A puzzle, a combat encounter, a cave or a tower with a few profitable rooms. It's actually a bit of a warm-up for Obsidian's biggest open-world project, Fallout New Vegas. One of New Vegas' divisive differences between it and Fallout 3 was the fact that its dungeons were similarly compact and scaled down to architecturally reasonable proportions, in contrast with Bethesda's Elder Scrolls-style dungeons that meander and wind to the point where it can take over half an hour to explore even the most tangential ruin. Storm of Zahir's world map knits dozens on dozens of small, fun moments of curiosity and danger into a comforting quilt of familiar pulp adventure. There's also some experimentation in seeing what sorts of other roles than adventure that a player might be able to experience in a fantasy world. So Storm of Zahir implements a trading system, letting the player play merchant between towns for fun and profit. In the first half of the game, it's underutilized and limited in utility. You can make some money with it, but you aren't able to trade more than ten things at a time, and the profits to be had are pretty minimal. This is in the jungles of Chult, an overgrown paradise with snake temples and trained dinosaurs. But then, at the end of the first act, you go back to the Sword Coast, to Neverwinter, Highcliff, Port Last, West Harbor, and Crossroad Keep. At the Keep, Kelgar is running things, but the original voice actor has been replaced by someone else who is just awful. The Kelgar here also seems disconnected from any personal growth that Kelgar went through in the main campaign. We're back to stereotypical dumb dwarf dialogue. He gives you some quests, but more importantly, he lets you set up a trade hub for your company in the keep. From there, use the lumber and leathers that you traded for in the first act to set up trading posts in all major towns and cities. These settlements each produce a unique high-value item to trade at much more profitable rates. More, you can pay to establish caravans between any two settlements and have them automatically generate profits as you explore an adventure. Each trade route has a paragraph's description allowing you to dramatize the system in your imagination better. When the network is set up, the overland map becomes populated by dozens of little covered wagons hauling goods back and forth. Sometimes they get attacked, and you can actually help them fend off the attackers in a random encounter. Other times they break down, and you have to bring them rep repair materials, like iron, to get going again. They pay you absurd amounts of money, but rather than breaking the economic system, these constant massive profits subsidize another of Storm of Zahir's unique design choices, Party Permadeath. In games with scripted companions, having, th having them be vulnerable to dropping completely out of the whole story can, te can tear ragged holes in the plot and leave it feeling incomplete. So most companions in Everwinter campaigns pop up again at one hit point if the player lives through any given combat situation. RPGs like Fallout 1 and 2 had permadeath companions for sure, but the companions also had much less dialogue than most modern RPGs. In Storm of Zahir, each member of the party is mechanically important, but completely interchangeable as far as progression and coherence are concerned. So when a party member goes below zero hit points, they must be healed or bleed to death. If they die for good, they can be resurrected by a spell per the usual rules, but they can also be left behind, or disintegrated, or otherwise removed from play. So, from time to time, you might need to roll a new character and equip them. Also in Crossroad Keep is an academy for adventurers, run by Darid and his party of airheads who kept coming to see you in the Keep in, during the main campaign. For one gold per experience point, you can train any new character up to be the same progress point as your farthest along character in terms of experience. With a trade network in place, you can afford to do this as needed in the late game when encounter difficulty gets jacked way, way up. Permadeath also contributes to the tabletop feel of the expansion, to the rhythm of chance encounter and chance resolution. The Merchant minigame takes the unforgiving nature of the permadeath system and provides a safety net that's fun all, all on its own. You can also do things like upgrade the roads and the equipment of the Grey Cloaks, even if you already made those investments in the main campaign. It's expensive to do so, and close to meaningless in mechanical terms, but it does affect an epilogue slide. Storm of Zahir is every bit the hack-and-slash adventure that Atari expected Mask of the Betrayer to be. But even here, there's creativity and experimentation to be found in the safe obscurity of a late-stage expansion pack. The merchant system, the permadeath system, full party customization, they're all polarizing choices and reactions to Storm of Zay here were very mixed on release. But in retrospect, it's these strong, unapologetic explorations of niche design choices that make Storm of Zay here worth playing at all. 
There's a collection quest for the merchant system where you've got to collect one of every luxury good. When you do, you're given a most unexpected reward. A sensory stone, wrought by the quest giver from Sigil. Holding it, you see a moment from Planescape Torment, the nameless one and the rest of the party wandering down an avenue. It's not unreasonable that the stone would be here. The sensorium was already filled with recollections of the nameless one, and the transition from AD&D to 3rd edition saw a war that destroyed all the guilds and consumed much of the city of Sigil in chaos and bloodshed. You can lose a lot in that confusion. Over and over and over again, we've seen tributes and references to Torment. It never seems far from memory for the RPG writers who had to follow it up in the years since. The strange and wonderful thing about Dungeons & Dragons, though, is that not only do both these games, Storm of Zahir and Planescape Torment, take place in the same universe, they're both equally valid expressions of the root tabletop game from which they've sprung. Mask of the Betrayer is clearly much more explicitly tied to Torment's legacy, but the things that Mask cares about when it comes to Dungeons & Dragons are more on the Dungeon Master's side of things. Mask of the Betrayer was concerned with deep lore, intricate world-building, complicated characters with meaningful secrets, all things that come up most often outside of play in Dungeons & Dragons, with a pile of source books on the dinner table and a spiraling notebook of doodle maps and encounter notes open beside them. Those source books have thousands and thousands of pages of things to scoop out and layer into a story to make it better, places and monsters and ideas beyond what you might imagine alone. That aspect of D&D is a huge part of the appeal, and getting lost in all that make-believe history and geography and monstrous biology can take up just as much time or more as playing Dungeons & Dragons. That's the Dungeon Master's job, to drink deep from the communal pool of myths and legends, and then sweat out as many coherent and memorable plot, plot threads as you can. The DM is just one person, though. Everyone else is just reacting and riffing and requires no real planning whatsoever to actually play the game of Dungeons & Dragons. To be a player, all you have to do is follow your nose and stay faithful to your character concept. Mask of the Betrayer fulfills a Dungeon Master's fantasy, a grand story that squeezes the source material for every last drop of narrative potential, tighter and more tonally consistent than you'd likely ever get away with in live play. Storm of Zahir is a player's fantasy, diving headfirst into the jungle with a couple of quests, a vague plan, and little ambition besides having a shit-kicking good time. Storm of Zahir does have a variety of NPC companions who can come with you, and they do get unique dialogue choices as well. All of those choices are shallow and cheesy, and yet, would your stoned ass be able to come up with anything better deep into Saturday Night D&D Marathon? The script isn't good if you compare it to Mask of the Betrayer, but bear in mind a lot of the same writers worked on both projects. Their games at deliberately cross-purposes, so don't bother to compare them. Compare instead the script of Storm of Zahir to your pal Keith when he's two beers deep and making a bluff roll. When you defeat the new snake god Slithering Minions, hacking and slashing or sneaking your way to the top of the final temple, there is no reason to expect anything fancy, and you don't get anything fancy. Like with the King of Shadows, the big boss fight is an understood inevitability. You don't even have to stop when Zahir's plot is foiled, you can explore the world as you please afterwards. There's even a secret region that opens up if you follow the right side quest. Then. When you're ready, you can retire and trigger the epilogue slides. You can actually retire at any time, even before the main plot is complete, although obviously that changes the epilogue some. Point is, though, the main quest of Storm of Zahir is an obligatory formality. Storm of Zahir is a buffet of small adventures to be picked at and gorged on until you loosen your belt, slump at the table, and say, no more. Surely, though, you have room for one last Wayfair-thin module. After everything that happened with Darkness over Daggerford, Ossian Studios continued to maintain a friendly working relationship with publisher Atari. This led to a second shot at doing an official adventure, this time a full expansion pack set to be released in 2007, just a short year after Neverwinter Nights 2 came out. And then, Atari made a small request. A brief delay while they worked out the kinks of a new suite of digital rights management software. This delay went on, and on, for 19 months. In time, both Obsidian expansion packs would come out, and still no authorization to finally release Mysteries of Westgate. Then even more time would pass. Ossian spent this interval ensuring compatibility, updating the expansion so it would be current with the new builds of the game. Finally, in 2009, the expansion was released as a digital download only. While Ossian's reputation within the community as the creatives behind Darkness Over Daggerford meant a warm reception for Mysteries Over Westgate from Neverwinter enthusiasts, it would have been extremely difficult for Atari to set up the module to fail any worse in the popular market. 
As a digital-only release in 2009, it was the kind of thing you'd have to hear about by word of mouth and deliberately seek out. Like I said at the very beginning of this video, part of the reason I wanted to cover the whole run of official Neverwinter Nights adventures is because I had thought of myself as a big fan of the second game, and I had never heard of Mysteries of Westgate either until it came packaged with my new download when I purchased it again. If I missed something as big as Mysteries of Westgate, how deep did the rabbit hole go? A year later, and now I know, the hole is actually bottomless when you get deep into the user content, but Neverwinter Nights 1's community is still going strong. Why is Neverwinter Nights 2 so abandoned today? Why didn't it have a premium module program like the original? Mysteries of Westgate is shorter and simpler than Darkness Over Daggerford, taking place entirely within a four-neighborhood city at around 10 to 15 hours. This is perhaps half the length of Daggerford and a quarter of the physical space. How come? Well, all those questions share a common answer. The toolset was more difficult and time-consuming to use than the original game's Aurora toolset. In that interview with Wild Surge magazine, Witch's Wake creator Rob Bartell said of the new toolset, quote, Dragon Age and Neverwinter Nights 2 took a different approach than Neverwinter Nights 1. They focused on professionalizing the toolset and making it more powerful, time-consuming and fiddly, rather than popularizing it and making it easier, more compelling, and more efficient to use. Their communities and content suffered for it. I remember a sad discussion with some of the key decision-makers on Dragon Age where they consciously wanted to make the toolset harder to use on the basis that it would weed out low-quality work. Unfortunately, insisting that all science fiction writers be astronauts doesn't make for better science fiction. It just results in significantly less of it for us to enjoy." End quote. As role-playing games have gotten better looking and more complicated, those not able to keep pace with the money and technology on display find it harder to be seen and heard. Today, the Unity engine and assets, as well as more difficult technology like the Unreal engine, drive a lot of independent development the way that the Gold Source and Aurora engines used to back then, but making a game look contemporary is a difficult uphill battle, and still often requires a larger development team than the small handfuls of people working on premium modules back in Neverwinter Nights 1. Mysteries of Westgate, visibly struggles under the weight of more modern production, knees trembling, sweat pooling on the brow. Where Darkness Over Daggerford took its cues from Baldur's Gate 1, Mysteries of Westgate feels very much like Baldur's Gate 2 in much of its structure. Where the original is rural, the sequel is urban. Athkatla was a much more memorable city than Baldur's Gate, and here Westgate feels much more alive and real than Daggerford did, or even the main campaign's Neverwinter. The city is dingy and draped in a perpetual mist. It seems like a real downer of a place to actually live. In contrast, Neverwinter in the main campaign didn't leave much of an impression at all as somewhere regular people might live and work. Here, everywhere you look is ramshackle buildings, ramshackle lives, and the color of damp logs as far as the eye can see. The gloom is atmospheric, and if Mysteries of Westgate existed in a vacuum, that would be great. But after the riot of color that was Storm of Zahir and more balanced, sophisticated use of moody earth tones and Mask of the Betrayer, Mysteries of Westgate seems like a module caught in between the aesthetics of Neverwinter Nights 1 and 2. It's much more detailed in its uh, visual elements than a Neverwinter Nights 1 module, but it shares their interest in a realistic, muted color palette that the Obsidian campaigns largely rejected in favor of a more saturated, illustrated look. It certainly helps Mysteries of Westgate stand out from the others, but in a way that singles it out as a bit of an anachronism. Which is part of the goal, to be fair. Ossian's work is all about trying to adapt the original recipe Bioware flavor to more modern games. With Darkness Over Daggerford, they nailed it. With Mysteries of Westgate, though, the results are much less consistent. There's still a lot of the kind of curiosity-rewarding design that made the previous adventures so good, with lengthy side quests layered densely into the three main neighborhoods of Westgate. Take the street vendor telling stories about the legendary ranger Minx and his hamster Boo. Obviously, you, the player, want to hear the story, because it's partly your story too if you've played these games, but the guy is just making shit up to sell you rats, claiming them to be hamsters. If you look in his big bucket of rats, though, which you're not really prompted to do, there is one real hamster in there. It squeaks at you in a way that suggests that you should follow it. So, Pirates of the Sword Coast treasure map style, you walk so-and-so paces around the district before finding a small cave under the street. In it is a tree. Eat the berries of the tree, and the hamster becomes enormous and tells you to stop its rival, an evil ferret being worshipped by a cult. So you go, you buy a pair of black robes, you infiltrate the cult, and then the giant ferret and giant hamster have a climactic battle. It's weird, hilarious, and easy to completely walk by. This is the strongest element to Ossian-style design, the way they make organic discovery especially rewarding by refusing to telegraph where their best quests can be found. 
Recent RPGs, and it's easy to understand this when you consider how expensive they are to make, have a habit of trying to funnel you into the most high-effort content. But it's better, I think, to go into something not knowing what to expect and winding up infiltrating a cult of ferret worshippers than to expect to fetch quest and receive a fetch quest. There aren't as many side quests as there are in Darkness Over Daggerford, but the ones there are tend to be more complicated and memorable than any of the main quests and mysteries of Westgate. A house blows up, and before you know it, you're teleported a thousand miles away to fight a lich. A companion wants to pick up some of her old stuff, but doesn't mention the angry ghosts that are there waiting for her. Storm of Zahir was an expansion with obvious novelty. Mysteries of Westgate is an expansion with a more subtle novelty, a playful unpredictability that stems from sharp writing and confident jokes. It's when Mysteries of Westgate tries to play it straight that the thing starts to break down. I'm gonna spoil the mystery for you. The vampires did it. That's it. That's as deep as the mysteries go. It was the vampires. The fun of the module is exploring the city and, it, and the side content. As far as the main mystery goes, it's written much more simplistically than even dialogue elsewhere in the module. On multiple occasions, your player character can chime in with something like, More banter, eh? Well, shut up and have at you! And I found myself more or less agreeing with that much of the time. When you, as a writer, have your own characters comment on the honor originality of a line of dialogue, I kind of feel like you ought to just rewrite the dialogue. Now, I know that's just one possible response of several, but still, it's an indication that even the author knows they could have tightened it up a bit. The climactic hour or so of the game is kind of a crapshoot in general. They throw villains at you one after another, named villains with a role in the plot and a revelation, and most of these schmucks you've just never seen before at all. If you visualize the plot structure, this is a literal bottleneck, a wide-open freeform experience narrowed to a single procession of rooms and encounters. For one boss fight, that's understandable, but this all begins well before what you might consider the true climax, so it feels arbitrarily constricting and often confusing, trying to figure out if you've missed some foreshadowing somewhere. The only part of the, com the climax that really sings and is the personal plotline of Mantides, the ex-paladin. He lost control several years ago and murdered some of the Night Masks, the vampire-controlled gang that serves as the game's villains. But he went beyond what was justified, smashing the skulls of teenagers who hadn't actually done anything to justify that kind of behavior. In retaliation, the Night Masks took his lover and partner in justice and then turned her into a vampire. He didn't know about that, and they hadn't seen each other since, until now. She then does something that I found kind of touching in a melancholy way. He despairs at seeing her, declaring that this is the moment that he's lost his faith. He renounces Lathander. He wants the wall of the faithless to embrace him and annihilate him when he dies. This makes his former love feel for him as much as she can feel as, an ev as a dead evil thing. She still loves him, somewhere deep, so she baits him into attacking her, reminding him of his vows to Lathander. She's a monster, remember? To encourage Mantides to see her as a monster now is to give him permission to let her go, to die by his hands as a release from an eternity of twilight servitude and on death for her. In the next room, with the next boss, it's a death knight who used to be lovers and partners with a woman whose cursed mask kicked off the whole adventure, similar to how Mantides and the other vampire were partners. Seeing the fallen paladin makes Mantides realize just how much farther down he could go, and how he hasn't actually slipped as far down as he initially thought. So he challenges the Death Knight to a duel, and for this act of devotion, Lathander blesses him with the return of his paladin's powers, his lover's soul, and even his lost golden plate mail. It's a classic, compelling moment. It's also slightly undercut by the fact that both these major antagonists had to introduce themselves in the very same conversation that led to these deep outcomes. In terms of dialogue, it's great. In terms of narrative organization, it's a disaster. What compounds the sometimes confusing choices in plotting and presentation is the fact that the module uses the spoken word cutscene dialogue format in situations where no voice lines were ever recorded. Theoretically, that's a positive correction, taking the tiny dialogue cube in the corner of the screen and then bringing it back down to the lower half of the screen where it traditionally belongs. In practice, though, close-up face shots of characters gesturing emphatically without moving their mouths is just super goofy every time. In the Aurora engine, you rarely got this close to the characters' faces, and even then there was no expectation they'd actually lip-sync any dialogue. The problem is that Mysteries of Westgate does lip-sync a good portion of their dialogue, creating a lot of uncertainty about when a character is going to read a line, or when they're going to hand you the script and point to where they're at on the page. 
Had none of the lines been voiced, it would have been a more comfortable choice than having such an off-putting inconsistency. In an interview with Rock Paper Shotgun from 2009, Alan Miranda talks about how difficult it is for a low-budget release to tackle the modern expectation of having most of the dialogue recorded. Quote, we knew from the start that there would be no way to professionally voice over Mysteries of Westgate to the extent that Neverwinter Nights 2 had been done. There simply wasn't the budget. Of course, having no voiceover was not an option either, so we approached it similar to what we would, had done for the Neverwinter Nights 1 premium modules, which was recording a limited amount of voiceover for important characters or scenes. But I think where we went wrong was when we created cutscenes that had no voiceover, because those stuck out more for players as being like silent movies. We knew the problem at the time, but were caught between not being able to afford more voiceover or cutting out certain important cutscenes. So we left things as they were, hoping that players would understand." End quote. I wonder what Mysteries of Westgate could have been had they been able to use that 19-month delay to continue expanding and improving the game, but Atari kept them in a limbo where they just never knew if it was next week or next year that their game might go up for sale. Without the kind of active community Neverwinter Nights 1 has, there seems little chance Ossian will be able to do an enhanced edition of this module the same way they did for Darkness Over Daggerford. And that's okay. I'd honestly rather see them do something new than try to rehab this title. When you consider the end, the problems might run deeper than just a facelift and extra voiceover work could address. The evil vampire comes out, lectures you for a while about how he masterminded events from beginning to end, and then the sun begins to rise. Haha, -ha, you say, foiled by your own cliché speech. But he isn't, he just shrugs it off and warns you to get your ass out of town by next sundown. The end! It's underwhelming, and honestly, kinda lame. It's a flat note for Neverwinter Nights 2 to go out on, but it's a flat note played to an empty auditorium the way it was released. Most everyone thought the concert ended hours ago. Despite any frustrations I had with it, I did enjoy my time with Mysteries of Westgate. What it does well, it does brilliantly well. What it falls flat on, it tried earnestly to make work. It might not be as impressive as the Obsidian expansions, but it's creatively unique from them, too. Dungeons & Dragons is so many things to so many people, and that makes it impossible for any game to have a truly definitive take on the base game. Dungeons & Dragons is a game, it's a storytelling tool, it's the stories themselves. The amazing thing about it is that anyone can do it, anyone at all. All it takes is imagination, a rulebook, and an extortive number of expensive dice. Game development, sadly, is not the same way. Whether dungeon master or developer, though, the measure of true success isn't how many people play it, but how much of yourself, how much of your own cre unique creative voice you can put into it. Playing a AAA fantasy game is like reading R.A. Salvatore. You know he's going to be good. It's a vetted and quality-assured kind of deal. Playing these older, obscure modules is like showing up to a D&D game you found out about from a flyer on a corkboard. Maybe nobody knows anybody at the start, and nobody knows exactly what to expect. We all know the game being played, but just saying, we're playing D&D, doesn't tell you that much about how the experience might go. It could be a disaster. It could be a night you never forget. You just never know until you show up, fill out your character sheet, and let the words of the Dungeon Master pave a road deep into your imagination. No one likes having their time wasted. When it comes to media, there's only so much time we've got, and everyone wants a sure thing. But a sure thing isn't the only thing, and you could be missing out on something truly special. You'll just have to roll the dice and find out. Thanks for watching. All the videos I do, but particularly this video, are supported via the crowdfunding website Patreon. If it wasn't for the individuals who are donating money to help me through the month, I probably wouldn't have been able to spend the year that I did putting this video together slowly while I worked on other, more immediate projects. I'd like to take a moment to thank by name some of the people who are currently donating $10 a month or more. People like Dirk Warbrul, Lo Beyonder, Brandon Boat, Matthew Mason, Galak, Josh, Dewey, Brian Plockelman, Chris Kayon, David Carlson, Sean, Jacob Siegelman, N.K. Jemison, Bobby Sims, Morton Sconning, David Betancourt, Josh Farkas, Ashley Rain, Nobody, Leo Neal, Chris Larkey, Tu Nyung, Dylan Ball, Michael Conan, Kunan, Kunan, Jeremy Saunders, C.E. Keane, Eric Jepson, Tyler Dowsey, Roman Alexandrov, Carl Gleason, Lasselis, Darian Desitel, Fergus Foley, Aurelian, Noah Kantrowitz, Tom Rowerdink, your local Moo Moo, Tom Vickers, Danny Kilpatrick, Colin, Booty, Connor McLeod, Saibot D, Daniel Pining, Nate Williamson, Alexander Sundin, Ethan Cossett, 
Tim Marsh, Abdul Rahman Alabsi, Radev Akoy, Andrew Tapp, Mark Phillips, Adrian Kumale, Skylar Vasily, Colby Howard, Nathan Jansen, Argus Swift, Sorcerer Dave, Yazan Barguti, Harry Eyeball, Free Morphine, Rich Stower, David Warren Christensen, Kazra Fadausafard, Matthew Cassidy, David Harpstreit, I Cannot Fly, Sharif Kazemi, Wesley M., Greg Rucka, Matt Bargainquast, Q Ray X, Edward Small, Zach B., Eric Amundsen, Colin Bassnett, Jordan Klein, Jesse, Dal Jesse Denton, Simon Nearfolk, Tyler Rush, Baby Fakey McName, Scorpion Strike, Cassie, Jared Olszewski, L. Weasel, Colin, Alex B., Fyodor Kasprzyk, Andrew Foltz, Byron Callan, Mikhail Aristov, Daniel Mower Myrie, Brad Smith, Micah Shalom Kessman, Martin Roots, Andy Mitchell, Eric Joyner, Ryan Van Dyke, The Soul James, Pascal Moray, Michael Atwell, Ian Boudreau, Nikolai, Lucas Bernard, Brennan Ritchie, Lucas Yonderboy, Alex Nikiforov, Cameron Booth, Gordon Graham, Stephen Heim, Max Pandoka, Sam Bellmeyer, Trivium Art History, Flebsy, Hans Kupier, Devin Fitzpatrick, Joaquin Coleman, Stephen Patiak, Andrew Boisineau, Ivan Yanchev, Anxiety Cat, Clay Harrington, Philip Coffey, Eric Robinson, Kyle Zaner, Alex Zelato, Carl Clark, Stephen Garrett Day, John Philippe Malouin, Will Edwards, Robert Glover, Jeanette N, Anthony Gallant, Maurice Descro, The Noble Gamer, Nemo Vandenbrink, Dice Prophet, Jack Harvey, Thomas Kistner, Andrew Opplinger, April Gillison, Will Wargrave, Noah, I know you're reading this out loud, Patrick McGanahan, Sebastian Pironi, Will, Domin, Will Dobbins, Alexander Krons, Luke Murphy, John Hendrick Hansen, Tom Painter, Oscar Stangenberg, Edward Clayton Andrews, Tinfoil Pancakes, Samuel Procopio Xavier, Dominic Carlin, Kim Winson, Devin Vernon, Jacob McMillan, Tizar Vicarian, Medal of Connor, Jody Warren, Elijah Nelson, Robot Ghost, Greg Merlez, Aiden AK-47, Josh Graytack, Sean Weber, Andrew Bregager, Hercules Johnson, Will Hooten, Sai, Cole Allen, Alexander Romanov, Jesse Wilkerson, Alexander Okudu, Lucas Marcondes de Mora, Toadheart, Aaron Albach, Matthew Sutton, William Holmes, Manuel Weedman, Zach Korpstein, Ryan Snyder, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Arturo, oh lord, I'm going to mess this one up. Arturo, I can't read what I wrote of your last names. I'm terrifically sorry. I'll put you at the head of the line next time. Dana Stubcare, Ian Glascock, Jeremy McQuaid, Nicholas Roma Jorgensen, Peter Flink, Tim Dodds, Jack 8A77AC, Kevin Schaub, Anthony Bardell, Andrew Montevillo, Jared Meyer, Andreas Larson, Brian Hill, Lars Brecken, Igor Babiak, Dan Thompson, Kumaran Vijian, Alexander Leister, Morgan Mall, World War II Freak, Aaron Darwin, Eli Bergmas, Dennis Clark, Daniel Pennypacker, Corey Bofill, Jack Dawson, Nick Cole Hamilton, Carol Henderson, Reference Error, Milky Way Resident, Vance Jordan Falls, Zoe Sheik, Comfy Hat, Eddie Burton, Gabriel Nichols, Ron Gervais, Jeffrey McIntyre, Senval, Victor Felton, Edward Clayton Andrews, Simon Anderson, Jonathan C. Mitchell, James Mosca, Tyler Rush, Adam Buchan Weiber, Lawrence Hurley, Transient Tiefling, Jordan Falls, Brent Cosman, Tom Vickers, Conceited Axis, Ludo Criticism, and Edward Clayton Andrews. I want to say thank you as well to everyone donating at a lower amount. It all helps and it all contributes to the making of these sorts of videos, which I hope will be more frequent. I appreciate everything. Thank you.